Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for, for joining um, us this morning, um, the Nice Trans Center of Excellence in Education. This morning, we have a treat for you all. We have Principal Beruti Kafeli that's going to do a presentation on racism, social justice, and how do we actually help and assist um, as educators, those individuals who are, are people of color and underserved. Uh, but before we get started with that, I want to introduce our Dean, uh, Amy Lingo, who's done an amazing job in leadership and leading the night stream, in leading education at the University of Louisville. So Dean Lingo, would you please bring greetings? Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. This is so incredible now that we're up to like 188 participants. I wanna thank everyone for taking time out of their schedule to engage in professional learning around the most important topic that we can possibly, possibly be engaging in today. As we think about at the College of Education about how we are going to intentionally address systemic racism and what our students need to know and be able to do in order to work effectively with students in Jefferson County and beyond. We are very, very honored and excited that this um, that we're ha we have this professional learning opportunity today. I would like to thank Dr. Stark for her leadership. She has done an incredible job of really elevating the Nystrand Center, engaging in the community, and really making a powerful impact in what our students and the community know about and trying to extend that knowledge around social justice and um, anti-racist pedagogy and inclusive pedag pedagogy. So I won't say anything else other than I am so excited to be here. I'm so excited that many of our students um, in our courses are here. And um, with that, I'll give it back to Dr. Stark so she, he can, uh, she can introduce our keynote today. Again, thank you, um, Dr. Amy Lingo for your leadership and um, we truly appreciate it, uh, the opportunity to be able to bring these opportunities to not only Jefferson County, but also to, uh, to the community and uh, across Kentucky because we have individuals across the state that's in attendance with us this morning. So with that being said, I want to introduce our keynote speaker whose name is Principal Berute Kafeli. And the topic this morning is just level the playing field and watch me excel. He is one of the most sought after leadership experts in education speakers in America. Principal Kafela is impacting America's schools. He's delivered over 2,000 conference and program keynotes, professional development workshops across the country, parenting seminars, and student assemblies over his 34 years of public speaking, an expert in the area of attitude transformation. Principal Kafeli is the leading authority of, a, of providing effective classroom and school leadership strategies toward closing what's coined the attitude gap. He is the recipient of over 150 educational, professional, and community awards, which include the prestigious Milken National Educator Award, the National Alliance of Black School Educators Hall of Fame, Induction into the East Orange, New Jersey Hall of Fame and the city of Dixon, Texas, proclaiming February the 8th as Baruti Kafeli Day. The purpose of today's workshop is to get educators to think about potential inequities in their classrooms. Educators will be able to take the information and strategies attained and immediately apply to their respective classrooms towards ensuring equity in their classrooms. So with that being said, I want to introduce Principal Baruti Kafeli. All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Good to be in Louisville virtually with you today on this, um, this 15th day of January. So what, a, what an appropriate day to have this conversation on the actual birth date of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, it's, it's interesting, ever since the holiday, and usually it's, you know, a few days after the 15th, my day is really today, the 15th. The holiday is good and, it's in, in, and it should be in place. 
But in terms of my, I guess, intense reflection of Dr. King, it, it really starts, um, it starts on his birthday for me. And then that takes me through the year. In fact, um, normally when, when I post something that has a relevance in, on, in terms of social media, when I post something that has a relevance to a particular day, I'll usually post it that day, that morning. But last night when the clock struck 12, midnight, I said, man, it's time to post Dr. King. So there's so much, you know, we could do a whole, whole day just talking about him, but I wanna just tie him into what we're doing. So appreciate all of you to have the cameras on. I know everybody doesn't, and I know everyone's not gonna feel comfortable with doing that, but even though, um, and let me change my view because I got too much of me in this thing. But even though I'll put the presentation up Zoom allows me to see about, as you would know, five, about five or six of you at a time. And, and I, I, I use my fingers for the whole time, just scrolling back and forth, left, right, to see the folks, to see my audience, because, you know, I'm used to being in front of audiences speaking. So when this reality became a part of my life, I said, I, I still got to see my audience, you know, so that's, uh, so I say all that to say, I appreciate you guys for doing so. You know, um, before I go to the presentation, let me just talk to you without, without the PowerPoint. That way I can see you a little longer. It's, we're, we're in an interesting time as it relates to education. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's particularly interesting for me because of who I am as an educator, uh, my reasons for becoming an educator, because who I am and why I got into this business back in 1988, which I'm gonna talk about formally in the context of today's presentation in a little while, but right now I'm informal. Um, I came into this business because I wanted to, I wanted to be this equitable practitioner. I wanted to be this social justice practitioner, but there was no language for either. Right, so, so it's not like I could have a conversation and say that I've got this, this focus on equity. I've got this focus on social justice education. The terminology social justice existed, but in terms of social justice education, there, there, there was no language for that. So here I was doing something that I couldn't really compartmentalize and, and, and tell somebody this is what it is. I'd have to explain it. So in, in folks seeing me do it within the building, you know, I started catching a lot of heat. You know, folks, folks were not happy with my approach to elevating test scores, raising achievement levels, preparing young people to be successful with their lives. Um, then, and that was when I was in New York City. I, was, I started in 1988 in New York, in Brooklyn. Then I came back home, which is where I'm from and where I've lived all my life in New Jersey. And the same thing started happening, although the achievement levels were rising. So people like, you know, questioning me, questioning me. Then as a principal, same thing, but no one could deny what was happening with the young people. Now I'm being informal, I'm gonna get a lot more formal with this in a little while, but no one could deny it. But then as a speaker, those doors weren't open to have the discussion we're going to have today. They, they, were, they were nailed shut. And, and, and it's interesting because the world shifted, May 25th in particular. The world shifted. And now it's, it's almost, I, I guess if I put a percentage on it, about 98% of the invites are to talk about that which nobody used to want to hear. Because, because people are starting to understand and starting to figure out that, wow, that's the missing ingredient. That's the component that should have been in place all this time. So, so, so with that, let me, let me bring this PowerPoint up so we can, uh, we can delve into it. And, and don't turn them cameras off, y'all, because I can still see you, right? Um, and here we go. I'm using as a title, just level the playing field. Notice, notice it's in quotes too, right? Just, just level the playing field. Just level it out for me and watch me excel. So, so, so I'm, I'm speaking for a student when I say just, hey, teacher. Hey, 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 administrator. Hey, counselor. Hey, whomever. Level it out for me, right? 
give me an equitable chance and I, I'll show you, I'll show you what I can do. So I just wanna have a conversation on equity, race, diversity, cultural competence, social justice education, as much as we can fit in to the time we have toward ensuring academic success for all learners, not just some of the learners, right? So with that, I think about any, every time I, I, I look at that language, all learners, or, or when we have discussion on everybody being able to reach a, a high level of success, it makes me think about the language achievement gap. Language is probably somewhere, it's probably somewhere in your psyche every day, the achievement gap. What are we doing to close the achievement gap? How do we close the achievement gap? Well, as, as a rookie teacher, being in my first staff meeting in 1988 and listening to the principal talking about closing the achievement gap, I'm sitting there and I'm saying to myself, I'm, 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 I'm young, I'm, I'm raw, I'm naive. And I'm, and I'm saying to myself, what is this? What is she talking about? Achievement gap. And at that juncture of my, 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 my life and that, that initial phase of my career, I couldn't wrap my mind around this language of closing the achievement gap because for me, it had implications. See, in other words, is this gap. It could be along racial ethnic lines. It could be along socioeconomic lines. It could be along language lines, special needs, regular ed lines, whatever, whatever line someone wants to draw. And I said, but okay, achievement gap, but we're not talking about the operative question. I said, the, the question that we need to be discussing is why? Why does this gap exist, right? And, and, and as I listen to folks talk about their why, oftentimes the why was rooted in economics. It was rooted in poverty. So, so because I guess because of my, my youthfulness, I'm saying poverty, what does that have to do with intelligence? See, I, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. I said, okay, I understand youngster could come to school hungry. I understand that challenges could abound at home. Challenges could abound in the neighborhood, et cetera. I get that, but I, but I could not accept that it had implications for a youngster's capacity to achieve at high levels in school. I could not wrap my mind around that. So here I am, this young teacher, and I'm saying, attitude. That word just kind of came to me, attitude, attitude. What if I can get into their head, so to speak, and, and, and shift, help them to shift their attitude about, uh, about life, about learning, about themselves. What if, what, if, what, if, what if I can position myself that way where youngster ultimately believes that he or she can soar like a bird, right? I said, so let me, let me focus on attitude while the rest of the school is focusing on achievement. And if I can shift the attitude, achievement will follow. Now, let me give you the demographics of the school. The school is 100% black. It's 100% urban it's in, in it's, and it's 100% free and reduced lunch, right? 95, 100%, right? So we're talking, and then, and then the class I had, we're talking 100% of the students have been retained at least once and about half of them twice. So, so we're talking about some real challenges for a first year teacher, but my mind was on, I gotta shift the attitudes. So, so, so with that, I'm gonna ask, I went back, I went too many, well, well, way too many. Let's start right there. Now, with that, I got a question for you. And the question is, why do I do this work? Why do I do this work? I'm, I'm, I'm asking you all right now out there in Louisville. You know, every time I say that word Louisville, it makes me think of this, um, this shirt that I saw in the airport. It had, I think it had like 10 different, 10 or 15 different pronunciations of Louisville. 
<laughs> and um, and and I'm always thinking, man. When I'm around, see, when I'm not around people from there, I don't care how I say it. But when I'm amongst you guys, and I'm I'm conscious of how, like, because I know some of you are like, Louisville, you know. So so it's so many different ways to say it. I know, but I'm I'm gonna stick with Louisville. That's how we say it up here in Jersey, right? So so I'm asking you, Louisville, how? I mean, why do I do this work? I'm asking you, what what is your why? What's what's driving you? right and i'll put a mirror on the screen what's driving the effort what's that thing that's burning up inside of you that says i gotta get this done what's that thing that keeps you tossing and turning what's that thing that preoccupies your thoughts your thinking what's that thing that you said i will not rest i will not sleep until this is accomplished right what is your why right and and, and when i ask you about your why do young people of color factor into that why specifically? I'm not asking you your why relative to the, the, the broad, the aggregate, the children. I'm not asking you that question at all. I'm asking you about young people of color, right? I'm asking you about Black children, Latinx children. I'm asking you, what's your why specifically as it relates to them? Yes, sir. That's the question that I'm asking, right? So I want you to, I just want you to think about that as we go through the presentation. Um, I don't, I don't live a day of my life without thinking about the why. So as a teacher, and, and for those that don't know the slang, I'm sure everybody does, but when we say the why, we mean your purpose, right? So as a teacher, I, I, I tried my best to walk in my why every day, not to work somebody else's why if that makes sense to you right I, I needed to walk in my own why i needed to feel that sense that sense of my own self-fulfillment i needed to feel that sense of i'm doing that which is the, the the reason that i came into the school in the first place right because if i because if i'm not doing the work that i want to do then there's going to be an imbalance within me right and i don't i don't want that imbalance so i got to be rooted i got to be grounded i got to be planted in my why my specificity my reason for being in the school in the first place so 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 with that let me just go through quickly ps221 and ashland elementary school these are the two elementary schools that i worked in as a teacher the, two, the one on the left in new york the one on the right in jersey and here instinctively i don't this word equity the only way the only way i knew how to use the word equity is if i was having a conversation with someone about the net worth of a home right because that that that, that was equity right we didn't talk about equitable practices in a classroom at that time so so but instinctively i'm looking at the students because see we sometimes we use this word diversity a little bit too loosely i'm looking at the students they're 100 black but I still knew there was diversity in the classroom. They, they, they're not monolithic because they, because they have, because, because of the pigmentation. Because here, on the one hand, they're living in different homes, right? They got different parents, right? They got different values, different beliefs, right? So, so, they, so you got all these differences. So, so although they were African-American or all the, I'm going to say Black, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. All they, they were Black, there was still diversity. Reason I didn't, the reason I don't want to use African American is because some of them came from Jamaica. Some of them came from Trinidad. Some of them came from Antigua. Some of them came from Panama, right? And others came from Brooklyn, right? And, 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 and beyond. So there were cultural differences. And I saw that up front and in person in my first year as a teacher that although they were black, they did not necessarily think alike, have the same needs, have the same interests, etc. I had to make sure that I accommodated that. <clears throat> and I had zero training in that. But instinctively, I said they're different. I, I had to be equitable without having that word equity to apply to it. So, but but by the same token, I came in with this historical foundation in terms of history, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, and which, which gave me a perspective that had I not had that foundation, I may have looked at them through a, 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 a completely different set of lenses, right? So then I move on to East Orange in New Jersey. 
which you see on the right, and bring that same ideology, that same philosophy, that same approach to them. And the test scores, you know, since so much emphasis is on test scores, achievement levels, they're going through the roof because I'm doing things that people now are, are, are you know, we, we go full throttle now in 2020, but doing implementing practices that a lot of folks weren't doing back in those days. So then 10 years later, I become a principal of this school, Sojourner Truth Middle School. And it was interesting. Now I got, I got some years under my belt. I think I know some things. So I, I get hired to be the principal of this school. And immediately I schedule a meeting with the superintendent. And I said, Doc, I want my school to achieve at the highest possible levels. But I need you to, I need you to do something for me. He said, what's that? I said, I need to make learning relevant. I need the students to be able to see themselves in the learning. Now this, 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 I'm the youngest principal in the district. I've never led in my life. And I have the audacity to go to the superintendent and say, I need to make learning relevant. So he said, what do you mean? I said, right now, I said, when students are in classrooms, they don't see themselves in the learning and they don't see themselves in the lesson. So, so they've got to be asking the questions, the question amongst, uh, among themselves, what does this have to do with me? How do I take this with me at dismissal? So the bell rings to go home at three o'clock. How do I take this with me when it has no relevance to me and my life? I said, so doc, I, I wanna re-examine the language arts curriculum, the social studies curriculum, the math curriculum, the science curriculum. And I wanna put these children into that curriculum. Can you let me do that? And I said, oh, and by the way, doc, since the school is all black, but even if it wasn't, since the school is, because this, this particular city, this is another one of them black cities. I said, I wanna create electives in African-American history, African history, going all the way back to Nile Valley civilization. So ancient Egyptian or Kemet uh, history, right? I said, will you allow me to, write those curriculums and, and do that. He said, I'm gonna let you do it, but I'm gonna hold you accountable. That meant like, if it doesn't work, I'm gonna probably get rid of you. I said, uh, no, no problem. Give me three years, that's a middle school. When those sixth graders become eighth graders, right? Hold me accountable for them sixth graders. Not the ones that already been there because because I'm doing something radically different. He said, I got you, three years. I said, we'll be number one in the district. He said, okay, three years later, we were number one in the district, but we were also number one in the state of New Jersey of schools of similar demographics. So now the question became, how'd that happen? And I said, very simple. The students saw themselves in the learning and thereby learning became relevant. Let me be transparent and vulnerable with you right now to make my point. I've been on here now for a few minutes. I don't know exactly what time I started, but I've been on here for a few minutes. For the few minutes that I've been on, if I'm not speaking to your world right now, guess what? You don't hear me. You don't hear me. If, if I'm not, if, if I haven't been speaking to your world, your life, your existence, for the, for the few minutes that I've been on here this morning, you don't hear me. You, 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 you sitting there saying, I don't even know why I registered for this. This dude is not speaking my language, right? I mean, that, that's, that's where it's at. So now in the classroom, that's what youngsters say. Every day when youngster is subjected to curriculum and instruction that he does not see, that she does not see that this has anything to do with my life. And, and, and I don't mean solely language arts and social studies. I'm talking mathematics, I'm talking science, I'm talking health, I'm talking whatever electives in that building, right? Because when math is taught correctly, it's not just numbers. That youngster sees self in the math because of its application 
to the world upon which youngster lives, which I'm gonna talk about as I, as I get deeper into this discussion, right? So with that said, let's, 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 let's get a little deeper, y'all. Let's put on your, put on your seatbelts. We're gonna get deep here. I, you know, I broke this presentation up into, um, I said, I wanna, I wanna deal with social justice education. I want to I want to I want to address equity and and then if time permits then 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 I got some other things but you know I know me and time probably won't permit but um you know it's it's social unrest social change and social justice education hmm. I thought about this a lot over the summer because see I was I was um I was the month of the month of March COVID hit the US, it got here to Jersey quickly. And then here I was suffering through it for about two and a half weeks. I was one of the victims, my wife and I. Then we get well. And now I'm, I'm, I'm living my life um, doing these virtual presentations every day. And then May 25th happens, right? May 25th happens. And I say, hmm. People are not happy. I'm not happy. And 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 it's 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 just a different kind of day. Right? More, you know, and probably more so May 26, because that's when really it got all the coverage the day after. I heard about it though on May 25th. And you know, that's you know, myself and, and many that I know just fixated on the TV and trying to understand. And then Right in your backyard, we find out about this young lady, right? So, 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 so we 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 learn of George Floyd on May 25, 26, but then we, you know, folks in your in 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 Louisville knew who knew about Breonna Taylor, but the Taylor, but the rest of us didn't know. So now it's like, but there's this young lady three months back in March, and wow. So now the world starts shifting and people are in the streets during a pandemic. People are in the streets because people are not happy. People are fed up. And it was, and, and see for me watching it and, and refusing to be in any streets because I had COVID-19 and I don't want it again. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching it from where I'm sitting now, literally. And I said, huh. This has school implications, right? This, this, this is not separate and apart from school. This has implications for school. And here, here's what I mean by that. I, 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 I got a couple of things I wanna say about that. Number one, from the day I set foot in a classroom as a teacher, I did not see the world outside and I'm putting my hand this way because that's where my front door is. So the world outside, I didn't see it being over here and let's put the classroom right here. So I didn't see the world outside in the classroom right here as being these two separate entities. I never saw that. I said the world out here and the classroom in here are one and the same. Every time I hear this language that says we're preparing them for the real world. It's like, I cringe, like, are you serious? We're, we're, we're preparing them for the real world? Like, like, so what is this world right now? This is like the fake world, the imitation world, the play play world, and we're getting them ready for the real world? I said, no, nah, uh -uh. this, this classroom is the real world, right? This is a component of their lives. So I'm not going to draw a line of demarcation between the classroom and the world out there and say that I'm getting them ready for the world out there because when they come into the classroom, they're bringing their world into the classroom with them. And some of us in the school as teacher, as administrator, as whomever have difficulty, challenges, in being able to connect with them and the world that they bring into the classroom with them. And that becomes a major part of our own challenges because the kid, the youngster, the scholar is not coming into the world removed or detached from, I mean, into the classroom removed and detached 
from the world out there that produced him. He's not coming in like, let me check that at the door. And now I'm just going to come in here bland. See, it's, that, that's not happening. That which, that, the, that which he's a product of, he's bringing that in. Right, like, like you hear me getting kind of loud now. See, when I started, I was just kind of in intro mode. I'm, I'm where I need to be now. But see, but I got some people in my circle that used to say to me, they said, "Kafele, you gotta like calm it down sometime when you, when you speak to audience. You too rough around the edges." I said, "I'm not calming nothing down because it's not a, it's, it's, it's not an act. I'm, I'm going to be myself, right? Because that's I'm being my authentic self because that's who I am. Well, that youngster's coming in." with his or her own authenticity. And are you and I positioned to be able to meet it? See, so, so, so I'm looking at him, so I'm looking at what's happening. I said, man, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and that's, that's just the two of them. You know, we, you know, I can put a whole, I, I can fill up the computer each slide with other, with other images, but I wanna use the two here. And I'm saying, this has implications for school. That picture you see on the bottom, that's in Newark, here, here in Jersey. That's all young people. That's not adults in that crowd. It's young adults, right? It's, it's youth. It's, a lot of, it's, it's primarily college and high school students. And, and that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people who were expressing outrage throughout the summer of 2020. So I'm, so I'm looking at it and I said, man, are the schools going to be ready to receive the students? And if they are, are they gonna meet this head on? Or will they sweep it under a rug? Will they pretend it's not happening? Will, you, it, will, 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 will they see it as not relevant to what we do in the classroom? You know, whatever it is. And I said, well, if the teacher has a social justice frame of, of thinking, then it's, it, it'll just be a normal part of what we do in the classroom, right? So here, I said, well, they're gonna to have to address it, but they gotta know what it is. So, so I, I'm saying here, it was interesting over the summer during that period, because of the work I do, and 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 you know I'm very public in what I do as a public presenter, public speaker, so and so forth. Um, I started getting a, a plethora inundated with with emails and Facebook inboxes and and Twitter DMs, direct messages from educators. Who asked? Who 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 stated the question that you see on the screen? Hey, Principal Kafele, in the context of all this going on right now, all these inner city streets are packed with people now. People are outraged. People are protesting. People are demonstrating. People people are rebelling. People are rioting. Right? People are marching. People are rallying. So so the question became: Hey, Principal Kafele, what do you recommend that I read? In other words, educators are saying to me, and I'm going to use their language. They said, Principal Kefele, I'm trying to understand white supremacy. Now, let me, let, me, let me give you further clarity. These were not educators across racial ethnic lines reaching out to me. This was 100% white educators, right, nationally. Hey, Principal Kefele, I teach Black children. I need to understand. I need, I need to understand white supremacy. I need to understand systemic racism. I need to understand white privilege. What do you recommend that I read? Hmm. So when I got the first email, I thought it was just, you know, just an aberration of one person, but then another one came and another one came and another one came and they kept coming. I said, wow, this is good. This is good stuff. They wanna know what to read. And, and, and I know what to recommend. As a matter of fact, let me say that differently. I know what they want. They want those books that critique and analyze and break down racism. I, I knew that. I got they sitting here. I, I, I knew what they wanted. But I said, you know something? The teacher, he, I want y'all to hear me well on this one. I said, the teacher in me will not allow me to recommend the books they want. The teacher in me will not allow me to recommend the books they want because they want books that are going to explain what they just asked me about white supremacy, white privilege, systemic racism, the critique of breakdown analyses of racism, etc. I said, I, I know what they want. I said, but here's the problem with that. 
if 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 the individuals writing me are, are neophytes, which which obviously they are, just based on the question, I said I can recommend the books that they're looking for, but then when they finish these books, there will still be this huge gaping hole in their understanding of racism. Here's why. Because they, they'll, they'll have some level of understanding of say 21st century, 20th century racism, but they won't have understanding of what got us to this point. See, I said, I need the reader to understand that this, this is not something you can just, you know, like if, if, if you go to a movie, like, like I refuse, I'm, if, if I go to a movie, right, or, or put a movie on TV, whatever it is, if I miss the first hour, I'm not watching that movie, right? I'm not, like, like, if, like if we go to movie theater, the show starts at two and I get there at three, I'm not going in there at three. If I can't catch it from the beginning, matter of fact, I'm, to be quite frank with you, if the movie started at, at two and I'm I'm there at two ten, I'm not going, right? Because because the the probably the most significant part of the film, like like like, is these shows that don't, because of this pandemic, I got hooked on, right? I never watched these little crime shows on um, on television, but because of the pandemic, I'm watching this NCIS, right, and and FBI on Tuesday and All Rise on Monday. You know, I never watched these. This just not my thing, right? So, but when you stuck in the house for a year, you know, so it's, you know things change. So like like now, so like it's like. I'm planning my evening around these shows and I gotta watch it at the, like the first few seconds. Cause if you miss that, you don't know what it is they trying to solve. You understand what I'm saying? So, so now I'm saying to you, I can't give you a book that, that, that shows you what's happening today, but you don't know what happened yesterday. That's like coming in at the end of the movie, right? So I say, so, so therefore I said, teacher, I'm gonna give you a book list. So I'm posting this online and all this stuff. But I said, but I got four books I want you to read. Four. They have nothing to do with these 20, these, these 20, uh, 21st century books. I said, number one, I want you to read Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. I said, I want you to read this. Because, because see, I need you to go back to 1619. But see, the first chapter in the book is in Africa. I need, I, need, I need you to go there because I want to defy certain stereotypes. I'll get to that in a minute. But, but, but after that first chapter, I want you to understand from, from, from the first day that the first Africans arrived to this country, it has been brutal. I want you to understand that. So from 1619 to 1719 to 1819 to 1919 to 2019, to 2021. I, I said, I want you to, I, I said, I want you to digest that. I don't need you to become a historian, but I need you to know some things, right? I want you to, I want you to, I want you to know that. Because see, chances are, teacher, if you went through a pre-service program to become a teacher, you may not, you may not have had not one African American history course. And and see, you you, you may have if if you chose to. See, they need to make it requ requirement. Right. But but in but in the interim here, I said, I want you to read this book. I said, but 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 the companion to this book is from slavery to freedom by John Hope Franklin. I said, I want you to read that, too. So get them both. Right. But then, as I as I would say to any teacher, you know, black history is something is not is not confined to February It's lifelong. But but we know that during February, it is Black History Month and there's a certain emphasis in February. But I say to teachers probably every day, not just during February, if you start them young people off during the time of enslavement, you might as well not even recognize Black History Month because you're doing the, you're doing the children a disservice, right? You're doing them a disservice. You, you, you can't start them off there. And let me, I just, I just lost my screen a second. Hang, hang on a second. Um, Cause yeah, I know you can't see it either cause something Bear with me one second. I got this Safari issue with Apple, but I'm gonna bring it back. There we go. All right. So I'm saying, I say to teachers, you, you, you can't start, you can't introduce the class. Let, so let's say you got this diverse class. You got, you got black, white, Latino, Asian, you got everybody in there. You, you, you can't start African-American history with lessons on slavery. Because what happens is you, you're doing them black children a disservice. 
and you and, and you're inadvertently creating an inferiority complex. And then with your white students, you're inadvertently creating a superiority complex. You can't start them there. You got to take them back. And when I say take them back, this third book I recommended. I said, I want teacher, I want you to read Introduction to African Civilizations. Now keep in mind, those of you that go on and purchase these, they're not gonna look like these. These are old covers, very old covers. And the two that you see in hardback, they're in paperback now, these are old. Um, Introduction to African Civilization, because I want the reader to see black, to see black people in terms, of, in terms of Africa in a light that is radically different from the way that they have been portrayed in media, film, television, pop culture, et cetera. I want you to see the relationship of black people in, in terms of the continent of Africa, the relationship to science, technology, mathematics, including algebra, trigonometry, geometry, um, engineering, architecture, astronomy, medicine, uh, scholarship, and I could go on and on. Agriculture. I, I said, I want you, I want you to see that because I want to. I want the book will 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 obliterate all the myths, right? All the stereotypes, all the distortions, right? The the book will handle that, and it's just an intro book, Introduction to African Civilization. And then lastly, this book is not a historical book, but this is the book that solidified for me that I must be an educator, and that's this book. It won't look like this the miseducation of the Negro. Once again, the miseducation of the Negro. I would dare say Louisville that um, there should be nobody on this call this morning that doesn't know this author. Uh, if you don't know this author, you, you should know this author. And I'll say that respectfully because the author is the creator of what was once called Negro History Week, which is now known as Black History Month. This is the creator of it. He was an author of 16 books this being the one he's most known for. He's the second African-American to graduate from uh, Harvard University with a PhD behind W.E.B. Du Bois. He was a dean and professor at Howard University, publisher, uh, creator of, 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 um, of, 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 of a journal. I mean, it's just a whole lot of different things, right? And you got to know this person and your students have got to know him. Right. I don't know that I would have entered the ranks of education had I not read this book back in the 80s. Right. This this book just did it for me. Notice the title, not the education of the Negro Negro, because it was written in 1933, but the miseducation of the Negro. It's, it's interesting that. Community, one of the perennial bestseller book, best best selling books, nonfiction continues to be this book. In 2021, this continues to be one of the highest selling books amongst black um, black authored books, a book that was written in 1933. So, you know, so these are the four that I would recommend to anybody. But now let's jump into this social justice conversation. What is social justice education? See, we, we, we know what social justice is. We know what racial justice is. But now in terms of bringing it into the school, bringing it into the classroom, does it have a place, right? And if it has a place, what is that place? And, 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 and have I incorporated it into my practice? So the first, the, the, the first, I think, obvious question is, what is social justice education? Let me go backwards for a minute. What is it, right? Because if you do a quick Google search, <laughs> you're gonna see a lot there. And so, so by the time you finish reading all the explanations, you may be just as confused. Those that are not social justice educated, you could be just as confused as you were before you started your your research. But because I, I you know, I pride myself on having been a social justice educator throughout my my years in education my 30 years in education, I went on, I said, you know, let, let me just write the definition myself. I, I tend to do that. I don't know if there's anybody out there that knows my work, but if there are, then you know I'm, 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 I'm good for creating definitions of various different things and making it work for me and whoever's gonna read it. So here I said, social justice education is the ongoing student-centered. I want you to pay attention to the areas that I underscored and put in uh, bold print and italicized. I'll come back to them. Social justice education is the ongoing student-centered exploration, examination, and assessment of the world 
upon which your students exist through their own lens. It's an interdisciplinary critical analysis of the world around them with respect to their relationship with it and how they fit in it via their own self expression relative to issues of social justice, social injustice, and overall systemic, institutional, and individual racism, whether it be unconscious, implicit, or explicit. So here, let's, let's go back and, and break this up a little bit. Is the ongoing student-centered? I'm saying here that yes, the teacher has a place. Yes, the teacher has a voice in the discussion, but it's not about the teacher's voice. It's about the voice of the student. It's, it's, it's student centered because if it's not student centered, then it is. It, it, so, so if it's not social, if, if the social justice education in the classroom is not student centered, then it becomes teacher driven social justice indoctrination, right? I don't, I don't, you know, as much as I want children to see the world as their teacher, as much as I would want children to see the world the way I see it. I don't want to impose that on them. I, I, I just want to put the information out there and let them use their, their own experiences, right? Their own thinking to come to their own conclusion. But I want to make them aware of what's out there. Be, you know, be, they see it, but from the vantage point of where they are in terms of their own maturation, their own development, their own age, right? So student-centered exploration, examination, assessment of the world upon which your students exist through their lens, right? So, because see, here, here's the thing, when I, when I say through their lens, I don't, I don't believe everybody out there on, on this call would necessarily be a fan of the National Basketball Association, but you heard of it, right? And, 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 and you don't have to be a basketball fan to know that last season, to salvage the season, they took the teams and they put them in what was called a bubble, right? You don't have to be a fan of the game to know that that happened. So they, so, so all the teams that qualified to play the remainder of the season, they were, they, they, they went to Orlando on a resort, and they stayed in this on this resort with the hope that they could keep the virus off the resort. So as I'm watching it from a distance from here, I'm saying this is impossible. This is not going to work. That virus is coming on that resort. This season will not be salvaged. And lo and behold, it never got in. And they finished the season and all the way to the championship, right? So they were in a bubble. And that meant they had no access to the world outside of the bubble and the world outside of the bubble had no direct access to them. They were in their own world where the focus was basketball. That's it. Now, of course, Black Lives Matter was in the bubble, so they were able to address it to the outside world, but they couldn't go outside of the bubble to be amongst the people they were speaking to. I hope I'm making sense. So, so when I say through their own lens, and then juxtaposed with that bubble from the NBA, the National Basketball Association, it hit me over the summer. There are teachers, and, and I mean, and, and in terms of the theory, I, I got it, but I never used it with this word bubble. I said, there are educators, forget teachers, there are educators who will grow up in a bubble. And when I say that isolated from other portions of the world. So there are teachers, there are educators who will grow up and never have reason to interact with a guy that looks like me, right? Be no fault of the educator. This is just where I, where my family lives and where I was born and this is where I was raised. So, so when I went to school, the kids looked like me. When I went on to college, I gravitated to the same population. So then, so now I'm in this bubble. I don't have intimate familiarity with people outside of my bubble. So now the educator, be, the, the person I should say, becomes an educator and there are people in that classroom and in that school that do not look like the people in the bubble that I grew up in. That's critical. 
So now, so now I'm, 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 it's, it's like, I knew these people existed. I saw them on television. I saw them at the supermarket. If, if, if you know, it depended on where the supermarket was, right? I saw them at the mall, depending on where the mall was. I saw them at the game, on the field, on the court, you know, on the TV show. But in terms of like really bonding, I didn't necessarily have that, right? So now I come into a school and there's children that grew up in their bubble, which is far away from my bubble. And now I'm trying to meet them. I'm trying to connect with them. I'm trying to engage them through their own lens. Here's the problem. I don't know life through their lens because I've never interacted with it. I only know life through my lens. So now me becoming this social justice educator and in and, 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 and this portion here, we talk about the world upon which your students exist through their own lens. I, I don't know that world. So it's not only it's, it's, it's not only me, it's not only them who are learning, but but I've got to learn at the same time. So there, there, there's a lot there. So now I become student if I have an interest in learning because there's a whole world out there that, that I don't know, right? It's, I, I, I don't know this world, but I need to know this world because I am an educator. I'm a teacher of these children. I'm a, I'm a principal of these children. I'm a counselor of these children. What do I know about their world? See, so, so now let's keep it moving. It's interdisciplinary. That means social justice education shows up in the math lesson because everything is numbers, right? There, there's nothing in the world that is not numbers. Everything is numbers. If you and I look at, look at life, look at stimuli numerically, right? These words on the screen are numbers because there's a, there, there, there's a, there's a number of words, a number of sentences, et cetera. So everything is numbers. And it's just a matter of how we apply it to the lives of the children in a social justice sense. Right, so science, social studies, language arts, etc., and then finally, the self-expression. So, so with that, I want to, I want to, I want to give some follow-up, self-reflective questions. Number one, what are the reasons that social justice education either exists or doesn't exist in my classroom, in my school? Right, I want you to just kind of think about that for a minute. Some of you may know I do a um, I do a Saturday a Saturday morning live uh, conversation on Twitter and Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and we got deep into this particular question this past Saturday. I'll tell you about how you could log on to that um, at the end of this presentation. But we got deep into this because you know there, there's so many layers to consider as to why it may not exist. Like like what's the position of the board? What's the position of the superintendent? What's the position of the principal, right? What's the position of the community? What's the position of the parents? What's the position of the teacher, him or herself, right? So there, 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 there's so many different variables to consider as to why it either does exist or it doesn't exist. But in this case, I wanna look at you, the practitioner. And, 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 and so, so let's assume that there's, there's no roadblocks, that I can incorporate social justice. So that now, in addition to the subject areas in, in, in the curriculum sense, I can also look at subject areas or content areas relative to how they, how they interact with the young person, right? So it's, so it's easy now to have a conversation about, about in the inequities of the world the inequalities of the world and still stay, remain consistent with the, the content area that's being taught. So now, but the question becomes with number one, but what are the reasons that I brought it in? Or what are the reasons that I'm shying away from it? The reasons that I don't feel comfortable with it as a, as a part of what I do in my classroom, as a part of what I do in my school, that, that has to be considered, right? So, so, and that's on an individual level. Now me as a principal, then I would you know, it would exist because we're we, you know, because it's a part of our culture as a building, right? See, I don't see see as a principal leading a school, I don't know what school is without social justice. I've never experienced that before, right? 
Uh, it's, it's, it, it was just an inherent part of what we did across content areas. And, and, and it's not just my teachers engage, it's, it's the principal. It's the principal having school-wide meetings with the students discussing various different issues of social justice. It's so interesting that, you know, all my students are, are adult, my former students I left in 2011 to do this work. So they're all adults. You know, my, my, my first students are in their forties now. And, and, and then I think the bulk of the students that I work with over the years are in their thirties now. And it, it's interesting when, when big issues dealing with race and social justice, racial justice occur in the, in the, in the media and the news and the world, Oftentimes, the former students will, 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 will uh, c connect with me on social media and say, Principal Kefele, given what just happened, we know where we would be tomorrow on a school day. They, they know we'd be in the gym or the auditorium and we'd be having a school-wide discussion. Yes, instruction is important, but we're going to suspend that for about an hour or two. And, and, and we're gonna have this just a school-wide discussion on what that is that's happening in the world right now. So, so that was predictable. Teachers, if they saw it on the news, they, you know, they didn't have to wait for an email from me to say, how are we gonna address? They know I'm going to address this and have the students to address it in a school-wide meeting. That was just who I was as a leader. You know, when we talk about leadership philosophy and style, that's who I was as a leader. So therefore, we, I, didn't, I didn't have to have teachers concerned about the infusion of social justice. The concern for me was how we went about it in each classroom because everybody's not the same. We're not monolithic. You know, I got the spectrum in the, in the school and then every, everybody in between. And that's why the necessity for that definition. See, see if, if, if your views run counter to mine, for example, right? Well, it's not about your views anyway. It's about the student, right? Because the student has eyes to see and ears to hear. So student knows and, and, and emotions to feel. So student has a sense of what life is because student is living life. And then here's you and I to guide the discussion, right? To guide the discussion, not to impose our own ideology. So, so what are the reasons that it either exists or doesn't exist? Number two, can my students, and this is a big one here, particularly my students of color, articulate beyond emotional reactions, the injustices that surround them? See, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm in this question I'm asking, can your students go beyond I'm upset, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm, I'm teed off. Can, 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 they, can they articulate what this is that's happening and can they put it in a broader context? See, that's, that's, on, that's on us. That's, that's what that master teacher does. That, that, that teacher takes that, that youngster beyond just emotional reaction. And now this youngster can fully explain, articulate, express what it is that's happening from his or her vantage point. Number three. Do I have the necessary cultural competence to engage my students in issues of social justice? That's a big one. See, I'm sure on the call this morning, you know, we, we you got you got various different schools of thought, various different levels of competence, et cetera, right? So, so the question becomes, as you look within yourself, and that's why all the questions are self-reflective, you know, those of you that know my work, you know I'm all about the mirror, right? All about looking within all about looking at self. And I'm asking the question, do I have the necessary cultural competence? See, see what do I know about my students, right? So, so relative to a social justice lens, a racial justice lens, a, a cultural responsive lens, a cultural relevance lens, a cultural competence lens. What do I know? Because let's say, let's say for example, and, 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 and let me be very clear about something. I, I feel, I always feel a need to express this. One could be of the same racial, racial ethnic group as the students and still miss, I've, I've, I've had those folks on my staff. See, you, you see, see I'm, I'm not, see, see this conversation is not a black white conversation. 
I, the, the students could be white, the children are white, and we miss. The students could be Latino, the, the staff is Latino, and we miss. The students could be black, the staff, the teacher's black, and we miss. See that, that see, because although we share a, a, a race, a racial group or ethnic group, we still may be coming up in different bubbles, right? So therefore, I still may not know you. So that always has to be considered. Right. Or I may think I've evolved out of what I used to be. That, that, that happens too. Right. So all that has to be factored in to when the students arrive. Do I have the cultural competence to engage my students in issues of social justice? See, that's that's so, so if I don't. I got homework to do. And I don't necessarily mean homework in terms of reading all the books on cultural competence. I'm talking about homework in terms of getting to know my students, putting, in, putting an emphasis on forging relationship with my students to the extent that my students matter to me, to the extent that I want to know them and I want them to know me. But, but see, for me, using myself as an example again, I knew as, as, as a young teacher, I couldn't know them fully in that classroom solely. No way in the world. That classroom just told me this is who they are in my classroom. I had to venture out, y'all. A lot of my success in that classroom, you know, when, when, when I won, I won teacher of the year for the building, the district, the county, and then I was a state finalist for teacher of the year in New Jersey State, and I was still new. I was still a young teacher and people would ask me like, I don't understand how you, how you get that far in this teacher of the year and you ain't been teaching that long, right? And I said, hey, you, you ain't been, right? You ain't been teaching that long, right? How, how, how'd you get that far? And I said, well, I was doing some things that you weren't doing because I watched you. See, while you went home to eat dinner, I was eating dinner in them kids' homes. I was in them buildings. Right. I was, you know, I, I was, I, you know, I, I hate to use it was, it's real. I was in them projects. Right. I was in them section eight homes. Right. I was, I was in those buildings. Right. I saw the mice. I saw the gangbangers. Right. I saw the graffiti. Right. I, I, I saw it all. I saw everything. But when they said, would you like to stay for dinner, Mr. Kefele? Yeah. But then I would bring my teachers that knew nothing about how my children, how the students were, li were, were living. I said, come on, jump in my car. Let's go, let's, let's go do some visiting, right? My suburban colleagues. Let me take, let me, let me take you in the neighborhood because you all know these kids. And we go in there. It was like, it was like the teacher went to another planet. Every time, it was, it, it was not, 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 not another state or a different environment, another planet. Because the conversations were intriguing on the drive back to the school, right? The, oh my God. I didn't know it was like that. Yeah, it's, it's like that for some of the students. Yeah, yeah, it's that, it's that challenging. And you in there yelling and screaming. They, they, they don't hear you because they got bigger fish to fry than your loud voice, right? So, so, so now the teacher starts evolving because now I have a better understanding of who I'm teaching every day. But the student becomes a teacher at the same time. Of the, of, of the teacher, because there's so much about the student or the students or just the world of the student that the teacher was not privy to, the teacher didn't know. So, so, so once I know you, and once I develop that cultural competence, so, so you, you speak differently, you see the world differently, your mannerisms are different, but that doesn't make me the teacher better doesn't make me superior and I'm trying to bring you to where I am. It just means that we, we our cultural backgrounds a little bit different, right? So, so, but, but, but it doesn't elevate one over the other. I just have to understand the cultural, the, 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 the culture, cultural background of the students upon which I'm working with, right? Because, if, because as I understand them, it puts me in position. <laughs> to now make the connections with them as it relates to learning, right? Number four, what type of professional development? PD, do I attend? 
toward developing a comfort and a confidence in engaging uh, my students in issues of social justice. Like, like see, see, it's one thing to recognize that there are social justice issues that need to be addressed, racial justice issues that need to be addressed. But the question is, so therefore, what am I doing to enhance my understanding, to enhance my knowledge base? What am I, what am I learning? Who am I interacting with? What am I reading? What am I attending? Right, there's, 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 there's just so much out there, right? But, but I've got to engage, right? Like it's, 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 it's interesting, you go to undergrad school and you learn about some of the, 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 the classical scholars, white scholars and the PSJs, et cetera. And, and you know, there, 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 there's so many, there, there's just so much research out here that was, that, that was conducted by black scholars as it relates to black children. And a lot of that, that a lot of that, inf that research, that material, that information doesn't make its way into those classrooms, right? So now you got to you, you, you got to hope that you you, you happen again happen uh, upon somebody that is knowledgeable in that that can lead you to the information if it wasn't provided. Because see, the bottom line is I can't teach what I don't know. I can't teach what I haven't been exposed to. I got to be exposed to it. I gotta know that it's out there, right? So what type of PD do I attend toward developing a comfort and a confidence in engaging my students in issues of social justice? And then finally, how knowledgeable am I on issues of social justice that directly impact my students of color? See, what, what, what do I know, right? See, see the, 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 the contrast between four and five the PD toward developing a comfort and confidence in being that instructor and in being in, in engaging young people. But this one's saying, okay, what do I know? What do I know this out there? You know, it's, 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 it's interesting. And I, you know, I, I hope that we, we're comfortable in this conversation. I, I share with a lot of my colleagues when I'm doing presentations, I say, you know, when I walk out into the world, I don't walk out into like, like, like there's my doors right here. I don't walk out into the world as a man. I don't walk out into the world as a human being. I've never done that. Not, not, not since I've been conscious fully of what I am. When I walk out into the world every day, I walk out into the world as a black man because I have, I, I, I have to be conscious of that because it's going to dictate how I go about my life when I'm outside of this house. See, because if I'm not conscious of it, I might walk into a pothole. See, see, I, I have to I have to ever be conscious of the fact that I'm a black man. That has implications. So when I ask the question number five, how knowledgeable am I on issues of social justice that directly impact my students of color? I'm answer, I'm, 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 I'm addressing that question with what I just said. See, there are issues of social justice. Like I was, I was talking, I don't share this often, but I will with you all, because we are a little bit longer presentation. Um, when I'm on the road, when, when there's no pandemic and, and, and I'm just driving through a town, you know, a lot of times in, in the kind of work I do as a consultant, I'm not just in big cities. I'm in these small rural towns that I've never heard of in my life and, and, and had no reason to hear of them because they're, they're just small towns, right? But I'm in more small towns than I am big cities because there are more small towns than there are big cities, right? So I'm, I go to these little towns, man, and these police officers pull me over. And, and I'm, I know I'm going to speed limit because I understand where I am, so I'm not even going to play with that. And they'll pull me over and have, and have no explanation as to why. Just do it, right? But when those lights go on, man, I'm like nervous, right? It's because it's a different reality. I'm not nervous for the ticket. I'm nervous for what that interaction is going to be, right? So, so, so I have to be cognizant of that. Now, I'm sharing that with you not to be political. I'm sharing it with you because it's real, because you have students whom at the high school level are dealing with the same thing if they drive, but they've got family and friends who deal with the same issue. These are, these, these are issues that are in many cases unique to, to black men. 
it's a reality that we did. I got to tell my sons all the time. All right, man. Make sure you you mindful of, of these police out here, right? That's I mean that's that's normal. Matter of fact, let me put it in this context. When I'm on location, and we're having a social justice equity conversation, I'll I'll, I'll and it's usually a diverse audience, but black teachers are usually in the minority in in a, in most places that I go, but not all, but most. And I'll I'll pose the question. Hey, staff, and, 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 and you know, women are 80, something like 84% of the total teaching force, so it's, it's mostly women. Black men comprise 1.2%, 1.3% of, of the total teaching force in America, so, they, so, so, so they're scarce. And I'll pose the question. Hey, staff, raise your hand if you've got sons who are of driving age or at least teenagers or above. Raise your hand if you feel that you've got to remind them regularly what to do if stopped by a police officer. Just raise your hand. Here's what happens. This, this, this is my world now. All the white hands stay down and the black hands go up. All of them, 100% of them. So I say, hold your hands up for a while. And it's usually women. Hold your hands up for a while. I want, I want the rest of the room to look at you. And they, they, they looking. And I said, okay, y'all put your hands down. Somebody had their hands up. Tell, tell the rest of the room why you do that. And they, you know, they explain what the same thing I just said. And then, and then every now and then a, a white woman hand will go up. And I say, talk to me. And this happens 100% of the time. I say, talk to me. Why, why is your hand up? She said, because I have a biracial son. 100% of the time, I have a biracial son who looks black. Right? So, so, so see. I'm saying who, who who is black, by the way, right? So so here I'm saying to you, there are these different realities. So teacher, how knowledgeable am I on these these issues? Do I do I understand what it is? There's a lot of popular, very popular, very well known presenters that you all know that I'm not going to name, although they know I use their name, but I'm just not going to use it today. Um, they're, they're, that are friends of mine because we're all in the same circles. And I'll say to them, I say, talk to me about your, your trajectory to becoming this internationally renowned speaker. And they tell me, and I say, wow, because we go to dinner and that type of thing. I say, wow. I say, my story is so different from yours. I had, to, I had to kick them doors open, man. Them doors were nailed shut. And, and, and my content is your content. But, but, but I don't look like you. So therefore, my, my journey took, much, it took decades longer than yours, decades, not years, decades, to get to where you are, right? Because, for, because of race. Because the content is the content, but because of race. I'm, I'm sharing these examples with you because they have implications for what you do in your classroom with young people, right? Let's keep it moving. Um, got a question for you. Matter of fact, let me let me just talk to Dr. Stark real quick. Dr. Stark, do I need to give the folks a break or or at this time or, or what you what you have in mind? Um, let's ask Tim. Do you all need a break? A five minute break? Ten minute break? Hey, let's keep it moving. And all those right. those who need the break, um, will just exit and and come back. No, those of you that need that break, just turn that volume up high, right? So, so, <laughs> so you can still hear me, right? <laughs> hey, Dr. Caffelli, do, do you need a break? I know you do you need no, a water I'm break. good, man. I'm in a flow. I'm good. I'm okay. good. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So take a look at these faces, y'all. I want to, I want to, I want to kind of transition to the equity side. When you see the faces of your students of color, who and what do you see? Who, who do you see? Just take a look at those faces and, 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 and re replace them with yours, right? Replace them with your students. Who do you see? Do, do, do you see a superstar, high achieving young person? And when I say superstar, high achieving, and, and you, you, you could be thinking about a youngster who's not achieving, right? But, but I, want, I want you to walk with me on this one. The student is not achieving at the level that you want the student to achieve. I'm gonna go back to my original question. Think of that student. 
there's somebody called at risk. I'll talk to you why, I'll talk to you about why I said somebody in a little while. Somebody called at risk. Student is underperforming, right? Do you see a superstar high achieving student? Remains my question with that student. Let me tell you why. Because see, as a teacher, and you all know this, it's just your, your brother from Jersey reinforcing it for you. We're not just, we're not solely teaching them for who they are. We're teaching them for who and what they will become. So if I inherited you at 12 years old and, 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 and there's, there, there, seems, there seems to be a lack of motivation, there, there, there seems to be a disinterest, I'm not looking at you solely at 12, I'm looking at you at 22. Because I know that there's a life out there and at 22, if, if, if you're on this trajectory toward 22, then there's gonna be some problems. So I'm not just looking at you for who you are right now. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, I got a vision of you that you may lack of yourself. So I'm looking at you at 22. I'm looking at you at 32, even though you're looking at you at 12. So I see superstar. I see it. So when you see them, what do you see? I had I had a few experiences um, with this slide with teachers. And I've had teachers zero in on the two young men on the top row. And in the first time I, I had the experience, I said, oh. But the second time I had the same experience. And the third time I had the same experience. And the fourth, I said, oh, let me tell you what the experience was. I've had folks in auditorium audiences that compared these two young men. And they saw the young man on the left being successful. And they saw the young man on the right being problematic. I had to, I, I had, I had to teach, present for like, probably the next hour just on addressing that that's you know one could put it in the category of microaggression but it's more than micro right they see they saw the young man on the left as being yeah he, he on his way they said the young man on the right they say he's slick and deviant and troublesome and the only thing that I could say, that I could deduce that what you see the difference is, is, is skin complexion. And you saw that young man and felt comfortable sharing this with an audience, including a presenter. Did that young man, they, no, no, one, no, no, no one ever said dark skin. But when I look at the two, what else could it be? It's not his hair, right? So, so, so I said, Teacher, what, where is this coming from? You said he's deviant. What is he? He's, he's just looking at a camera. Where is this coming from? So, so, so in my mind, I said, well, if you if that's what you see, what are you what are you seeing of your students? Because you don't know this student. What are you seeing of your student back at the school, in the classroom? See, so so that's why this thing is so critical. You and I gotta go deep into ourselves, our soul. When you see the faces of your students of color, who and what do you see? Who do you see? I, I, would, I would challenge anybody on this call to ask yourselves that question daily. I know you like, like you, you, you're virtual right now, you look at your youngsters on the screen. I would challenge you. And, 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 and be, be, because you have to see that you, you don't know what direction that each of them will go into, but you've got to know definitively. And, 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 and notice I said, no, I didn't say think. I, you, you got to know definitively that my students, in this case, students of color, are going to achieve at high levels because I am in their space. See? That now that that puts that puts an onus on you. See, like there's a question. I don't I don't know if any of you read a book I wrote called The Teacher 50, 
what is these 50 self-reflective questions for the teacher. And the very first question in the book is probably the most important question that I ask. I've written several of these 50 books, about five of them. And, and I think it's the most important question that I ask, are my students at an advantage because I am their teacher? Let me say it again, are my students at an advantage because I am their teacher. So because you guys gave me permission to keep it moving, I want to I want I want to get heavy into something here. Notice the pictures when I when you see the faces of your students of color, what do you see? Well, here's what I want to do. I I, I want to make this concrete. When you see the face of this 8-year-old student of color, who and what do you see? I decided to bring you somebody that you know, young that, 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 that this person is going to talk to you, right? To make this really concrete for you. So I brought this guy with me. He's, that's, that's eight-year-old me, right? And, and he wants to talk to you. He wants to have a serious conversation with you. You know how you and I, I'm sure that all of us have done this before. You said, what would my younger version of me say now if, if he knew what I know today, right? So, so I, 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 went, I went a step further in terms of just thinking in my mind, what would, what would he say? What would he do? Who would he be if he knew what I know now? I went a step further and I actually put it in, these pre, in, in, in some of my presentations. So what would he say if he was one of your students, right? And, and, and this is what I came up with. I came up with, hey, teacher, I promise to do my part throughout this school, this year. But as my teacher, I only ask of you these five simple things. So, so I, I sat around over a period of time and I said, what, what, what would he say? Given what I know at 60, what would this eight year old say? And I said, number one, simple, believe in me. Simple, believe in me. Hey, Louisville, do you believe in them youngsters? See, because you, 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 you know that matters. Do you believe in those youngsters? And I don't mean the one that comes in high flying. You know, I was a good student at that age. I, so, so, so I, you know, I was worthy of somebody really believing that I was going to do big things with my life. So, so believe in me. But notice the three dots. He got more to say on that one. With everything you've got. But, but I'm thinking about that youngster, because I can think about youngsters in my classroom who were getting into trouble, that type of thing. Do you believe in them, the ones in your classroom? He said, believe in me with everything you got. I got four more things, he said, and that's all, and then I'm gonna be fine in your classroom. He said, get to know them. Hey, teachers, your educators out there, you, you, you know them? But see, I don't mean like you know me because you know my name. I don't mean you know me because you know because I sit in that same seat every day and, and, and I'm in this classroom. I'm talking about, do you know me relative to my life experience, my reality, my, my, my challenges, my obstacles, my needs, my interests, my goals, my aspirations, the way I think, the way I process information, the way I learn, the way I make sense out of new information, what motivates me, what inspires me. Do you know me that way in my fullness? He said, get to know me beyond who I am in my classroom. Do you know me? But then he said, hey, teacher, prove to me that you care about me. I know definitively because I because I do students I do small group student mm -hmm. sessions with young people, particularly the boys. I go to school. The principal will say, "Can you talk to like the twenty boys, right?" And they and they they reveal things, and one of the things that they reveal, <laughs> man, everybody care about us here. I hear it all the time, I, I, and I don't let them get away. I correct. I tell them, no, that's not true. But then I go to the staff when I do the the, the meeting with the staff, and after I say, "Look, this is what they said." They said nobody cares about them, right? So, so, so I know you care, but that's not how they perceive you. And their perception is what matters. Their perception is what carries, not what you and I preach. So prove to me that you care about me, he said, but he, but he has something else to add to it and that you're committed to me. 
Hey, little bit, y'all committed to these young people? You care about these young people? You losing sleep over these young people? When the strategy's not working, are you coming up with the one that does? Are you full? Are you all in and committed to that young person? Number four, he said, challenge me to reach my potential. Don't, don't pat me on the back because I'm doing mediocre, because, because I'm doing average work and you stroking me, you pat me on my back, very good, keep up the good work. No, I'm not. And, and I'm gonna be able to compete with this world and I'm doing average work. When I have the capacity to do more, don't, don't pat me on my head telling me that's okay. Hold me accountable for maximizing my potential. That's what he's saying. I'm just thinking back. I'm just reflecting back. What would I say based on what I know now? But then he, then he, but then he wrapped it up. He said, expose me to my history. Oh, man. He said, I need to know who I am. I need to know who I am in history so that I understand my place along the continuum of life. So that was his post that he said, hey teacher, am I at an advantage because you are my teacher? Is there something advantageous about you being a teacher? But you know something folks, because I'm using I'm using this young man to to to, to introduce this equity conversation. I, I decided I said I can't stop at eight. I said let me bring this 13 year old here because 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 some of y'all are in the middle school, late middle early high school, right? So I brought I brought this young man with me. Take a look at him. He's a little older now, and he he's got something to say too. But it's a little bit different, y'all. Look what he said. He said he said uh, hey teacher. I'm 13 now and I've fallen off. Uh-oh. I got a question for all of you. When that youngster comes to you who has fallen off or who never got on, where, where are you at on that? See, remember that eight-year-old? He was showing promise. He said, I've fallen off. Let's, let's see what that means. He says, stuff is happening in my life that you just wouldn't be aware of unless I told you. I got stuff going on, folks. I got stuff going on. I'm watching my mom get beat down. That's one of the things I got going on. That, that, that has, that I have lost my focus on education. I got, I got this happening, this happening, this happening, this happening, let's keep going. He said, I've lost my focus, my drive, my ambition, my purpose. There ain't nothing in the world I wanna be anymore, nothing. He said, I don't really believe in myself anymore. He says, school has lost its relevance. You see that picture right there? He had dropped out of school. Your presenter today is a high school dropout. He had quit. His mother tried to save him and, and, and she was on him. And ultimately he attended four different high schools in five years. So he says schools lost his relevance. So while, so when she kept putting me in schools, I, you know, I never went. I went, to, I went and hung out with the people that thought like me, right? I like and prefer what the streets have to offer at this time in my life. So you just think about what the streets have to offer and I accepted it, right? That's, that's who I was. So, so why am I sharing this with you to tell, to give my life story? No, I'm sharing this with you to ask you, what are you doing with that youngster that shows up at your school? Because I know that youngster shows up. What do you have for that youngster? Because he said, hey teacher, do you understand what it is to walk in my shoes? Are you prepared to meet me where I am? And am I a part of your why, meaning your purpose? And so, so when you think about your own purpose, am I a part of it? See, but I got one more. I got that high school youngster to bring to you. When you see the face of this 18 year old of color, who, who and what do you see? There he is. There he is. Let, let, let me let him talk to you for a minute. And then we're going to get, we're going to get deep into this equity. He said, Hey teacher, I'm 18 now and I'm completely lost. I'm done. My mother, she knows I use this picture and she hates it. She gave it to me. I needed it for a, a totally different purpose. She didn't know I was going to use it for presentations. I needed it because an, an organization was doing a documentary on me and they asked for some stills. She didn't know I was going to be using it this way. And she, and when people make, you know, they post it on Twitter when they see the PowerPoints and she calls me because she's on, my, my mother's 86, but she's on social media every day. <laughs> so she, um, she'll call me, why are you still using that picture? 
because she knows I was probably high in the picture, right? That's that's why, <laughs> right? So so here, I'm in my fifth year of high school with a 1.5 GPA. I've attended four different high schools. I have zero ambition. My decision making continues to be problematic. My self esteem is very low, and my self confidence is virtually non existent. My counselor even informed me that I never amount to anything. I'm asking you, when that youngster shows up at your doorstep, those of you at the heights, the secondary level, who are you? What are you? Is that youngster doomed? Because, because, because of what has happened up to this point? Because here he said, he said, hey, teacher, don't quit on me, though. Don't quit on me, because who knows? In addition to earning my undergrad degree in two years and summa cum laude, went on and quickly became the teacher of the year and then won the Milken Award as a principal and 150 other awards, right? So, so folks said, how, like, like it, one thing they said, how did you, did you graduate summa cum laude? I didn't go to college for five years after high school. I, I was on the streets for five years. I enrolled in a junior college, but I never went. I sat in the student center with my friends but I never went to class. But then five years later, I said, man, I'm 23 years old. I ain't got nothing. Let me go to school. Went to school, stumbled on a couple of things, which I'll talk about soon. And, and, and graduate took, was taking multiple credits, acing everything and graduate summa cum laude. And here I am speaking to you this morning. See, so, so don't tell me that that youngster that seemingly is unmotivated. Hear me, I think this will be the most significant thing I say to you today. Don't tell me that that youngster who is seemingly unmotivated and detached, don't tell me that youngster can't be an author of 12 books, 12 bestsellers, a, 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 a uh, turnaround principal, a teacher of the year, a recipient of, a, of over 150 awards in education. Don't, don't tell me that youngster can't be that youngster because I'm a walking, living, breathing example. See, so I'm, I'm saying to you that I'm, I'm asking you, and then we're gonna talk strategy now, what do you have? What are you bringing to the table? So I'm saying here, so hey teacher, where do, where do you see me? 10, 20, 30 years from now, as a result of having me, a result of me having you as my teacher. Let's jump into this equity conversation, y'all. Do I bring an equity approach to my instruction? Oh man. Am I an equitable practitioner? Let me tell you something, y'all. Let me tell you something. I'm at a point in my life as a presenter. It, it, you know, when, when, when you leave, when you when you leave a school and leave everything on the table, when I left North Tech, my last school in 2011, I was just chasing a dream. I wanted to be a public speaker before I wanted to become a teacher, but I didn't have anything to talk about. I had no story. I had no content. I just knew that I admired people who were speakers. So I said, OK, let me live life and come back to it. So I taught and then led, but I would speak in little empty cafeterias five days a week, PTA meetings where there was nobody there, like one or two parents. Okay, so, so all over New York City, all over New Jersey, all over Philadelphia, every day jumping in my car, driving miles and miles to talk to like five parents on a, on a 10 on a good night. I'm trying to build my craft as a speaker, right? So then in 2011, I said to my superintendent, I'm leaving. He said, what you going to do? I said, I'm going to build a speaking and consulting business and education. He said, do you have clients? I said, no. Do you have any clients? I don't have not one, sir. Aren't your boys getting ready to go to college? Yes. Don't you have to pay for it? Yes. Don't you have a mortgage? Yes. Don't you have a wife? Yes. How are you going? Don't, don't, you know, you have to pay for your benefits. Yes. They're about 2000 a month. Yes. How are you going to do it? Just watch me. So now I stepped out. And here I am today. But a funny thing started happening. When you when you out there like that, anybody that calls you, can you come speak? You like you say yes before they finish the sentence, before the question. Can you come? Yes. Right. So so they're calling me. Can you come speak? Yeah. What time? Right. Sorry. So so like I'm come everywhere. And I'm I'm like on the road like every day, right? 
So now somewhere in there, this word equity, hear me somebody, this word equity comes about. So like, I'm like, okay. I had all these equity presentations, but I didn't use the word, but nobody wanted me to talk about those. They wanted me to talk about closing the attitude gap in some of my other presentations, but they didn't want the ones that deal with race and ethnicity and social justice. So they would see it on the website, but they bypass it. Nobody would invite me to do those. So then here comes this word equity, it becomes a thing. Now they see it on the website. I'm like, it's been there all this time, <laughs> right? Oh, could you come and talk about equity? Yeah, but why didn't you ask me five years ago? Right, so, so now I come, I want y'all to hear me well on this one. And they're talking equity and everybody wasn't receptive to an equity discussion. Hear me somebody, everybody wasn't receptive. So I'm in there and now they hit me like heavy equity. Principal Kefele, want you to talk about equity. Hit Principal Kefele, equity, all right. So I go in there, let me say it again. Everybody wasn't receptive to the equity discussion. Hmm. So now I started being disrespected. I started being heckled. I never experienced that before. Huh? You, you yelling at me from the audience and your superintendent sitting in the room and your print the principals and you, 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 you making fun of me and, 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 and calling me out of my name. Like I'm some comedian at the Apollo in Harlem. I mean, it, it, it was, it, that's what, that was my life. So now here come the equity call. Superintendent, Principal Fair, can you talk about equity? Uh, I don't know. Let's talk about it for a minute. Hey, superintendent, is your district ready for the equity conversation? Well, not all of them, that's why I'm calling you. I said, well, well, let me tell you something, Doc. I don't wanna come there if they're not ready because I've, I've been disrespected enough times talking about equity. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna stand and do a presentation and be disrespected, then go on my social media page at night and they calling me all sorts of names, including the N word, right? I don't, I don't want that. So, it's your, so get them ready and then I'll come in and have the conversation. Right? Here's what I'm saying to y'all. I hope you hear me. I'm saying with those experiences or the one that's just sitting there like this, right? That, like, like just showing that yeah, I ain't listening to you, buddy. Right? So, so, so now like, like sitting on the front row, right? I said, okay, I reached the conclusion. I want y'all to hear, hear me, hear me, hear me. I said, equity is not solely something that you do. I said, equity is who you are. That's a different conversation. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all ain't hear me, you too far away. I gotta say it again. Equity is not solely something that you do. Equity is who you are. To take it further, equity is a reflection of the teacher's humanity toward the students that he or she services. Oh man, y'all didn't hear that. Equity is a reflection of the teacher's humanity toward the students that he or she services. Let's talk about it. So here's the teacher that's upset with me that wants to heckle me. Hey, Principal Gafele. They hostile, man. Hey, Principal Gafele. Why are, we, why are we talking about black and white and Latino and Asian? I don't see black in my classroom. I don't see white in my classroom. I don't see Latin or Hispanic in my class. All I see is the children. I see the babies. Why are you here talking about this? And in my mind, I'm saying, because the superintendent asked me to talk about it. That's why, right? But, but, but I'm not going to say that. So why are we having this discussion? And then here go to Amen Corner. So, so, so now I'm being subjected to this, right? So I'm saying, man, you don't see black. You don't see white. You don't see Latino. You don't see whatever portion that part of Asia that a youngster may come, you don't see that? Then guess what the student's saying to you without saying? Hey teacher, if you don't see my race, ethnicity and culture, you don't see me. And if you don't see me, you cannot effectively teach me. 
And if you cannot effectively teach me, why am I in this classroom with you? You can't be colorblind and culture blind in 2021. You can't be colorblind, culture blind in 1921, right? It's, 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 it just doesn't work for a multiplicity of reasons. Let's look at some of them. Y'all still good without the break? Okay, I only I saw five when I asked it, so I should have, I'm gonna try to scroll. Let me ask that question one more time. Y'all still good without the break? <laughs> okay, so let me, let me keep going. Listen, so here's that teacher. I will, I will never forget one, and maybe I shouldn't even be admitting to this, but, but I, I'm just, I'm honest and transparent. And, and, I, and I want you guys to just see this through my lens. I'm at a school, I'm at a university somewhere and, and, and the superintendent and, and her cabinet are in the room and I'm doing this equity conversation for like superintendents and principals and so forth. And, and, and now they, you gotta come to my district. Okay, let's, let's sign the contract. So now are they ready? They're ready, okay. So now I get there. And here comes the teacher. Why are we having this conversation, right? I don't, I don't see black children. Now I saw the data already because I was, I, you know, that's what I studied the data before I start work, before I start working in the district. I saw the data. Black students are struggling. In fact, it was horrendous. I don't see that. I said so. So she kept going. The crowd, the, the, the amen corner was clapping, and then finally, once she finished, I said, "Teacher, let me let me let me say this to you." I said, "Teacher, at three o'clock, what what time's your bell ring? A dismissal, three o'clock. Okay, three o'clock, teacher. Those students that you don't see these these differences, that diversity in your classroom, at three o'clock, they are going outside into a world that will see everything you don't see." They're going to, that world going to see that. And you have created this artificial learning environment, this fantasy learning environment that gives them the impression that this is what the world is. The world is real. And I want to prepare the student, not just content wise, academically, but I want to compare the, I want to, I want to prepare the student for everything the world has to offer. I want the student to understand that the world is what it is, and therefore to be ready to navigate it and still experience success. That's on the one hand. But I said, on the other hand, hey, teacher, those young people, particularly of color in this regard, do you realize they stand on some broad shoulders? They, they stand on some real excellence and some real struggle, and they are products of it, recipients of it, descendants of it. I want those children to know that story. But by the same token, I want the students who are not of color to also have appreciation for what, for, for what no one in the room knows about the story, which I'm gonna give you some examples in a little while. I, I want them to know. I don't wanna hide that, but see from the vantage point of the teacher now, I can't teach what I don't know. I can't teach what I don't know. I have to be exposed to it. Like, let me give you this example. So if those of you have heard me in the past, you, you've heard me use this because this is very simple for me to use without me getting deep. Um, you notice there's a lot of light on me, right? I got lights, I got lights all over the place, right? So, but here's the thing. When I was in school, they taught me, my teachers taught me, and my, several teachers, because it came up, I'm sure, over the years, they taught me about Thomas Edison. So Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And I took it and ran with it, no need to question it, okay. Cool, Tom said it. So then I'm going through my life and, 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 and I become this, 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 this student of African-American history when I got to undergrad school. And that's what allowed me to graduate summa cum laude because when I, when I just stumbled on African-American history, I became obsessed with it, right? Literally, I'm using that word, not figuratively, literally, I became obsessed with it. And I became this, this voracious reader that would not stop reading. And it introduced me to me and then academic learning became very easy because I now realized who I was when I looked in the mirror. So somewhere along the way, if I could put my finger on it real quick, it's somewhere, where is it? Here it is. I, um, I stumbled on this book. 
Blacks in Science. I stumbled on this by Ivan Van Sertema, I'm covering his name, Ivan Van Sertema. And in this book is a man that I had never heard of before, Lewis Latimer. I never heard of Lewis Latimer. An African-American young man that Thomas Edison hired to work with him. Now we're talking in the 1880s, not too long after the Civil War and emancipation, end of enslavement, Juneteenth, et cetera. He, so Edison hires this young man. Edison comes up with a bulb, but it doesn't do what my bulb and your bulbs are doing. It would flicker out quickly. It was very expensive to produce. It got hot, excessively hot, and it was dangerous. Lewis Latimer understood the flaws in the original bulb. So he went to Edison and said, look, I can, I can fix this. He said it, it's, it, it needs what's called the carbon thread filament. Allow me to put the carbon thread filament in the bulb. That's Lewis Latimer, L-E-W-I-S-L-A-T-I-M-E-R. He puts the, the, the filament in the bulb and it glows like your lights are doing and mine are doing now. So, so, so then because of that, he went on and wrote a textbook, the first textbook ever written on electrical lighting in the United States. Now his name is out there. So now the cities, cause you know, cities are not lit, lit by electrical lighting because it didn't exist. Now you got electrical lighting. So the cities, New York, Washington, um, Philadelphia, Montreal over uh, up north and, and London overseas and others, they said, we ready to install electrical lighting in our cities now since, since, since it exists. So they reach out to Lewis Latimer to supervise the installation of electrical lighting. And I'm reading this book and I say, you mean it took me to be 24, 25 years old? to know that Lewis Latimer existed. And I was told Thomas Edison. So you're, you'll recall earlier in the presentation, I, when I put those other books up before the Mayflower from uh, Slavery to Freedom, Introduction to African Civilization and, and Miseducation of the Negro. Well, as I was suggesting them and recommending them to the teachers and, and also talking about people like Lewis Latimer and others, the teachers started putting the covers of those books. They would get them from Amazon and put the covers of those books on their Twitter page and tag me. And here's, here's, a, here's, here's a summary of what they were saying when they tagged me. Principal Gafele, I'm, I'm angry. This is what they're writing on Twitter, I'm angry. And I'm thinking they're gonna be angry at me. I'm angry because I've been teaching, like, like one teacher said, I've been teaching 25 years and I read the books you recommended. And I am going to conclude I have been lying to children for 25 years. It's a white woman. And then more white teachers began to follow suit. I'm angry. I'm angry. I'm angry. Because I have been teaching for, for, for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. I've been lying to these kids. I didn't know this. This is what they're saying. I said, yeah because you can't teach what you don't know. You can't teach what you haven't been exposed to. You didn't know that this information was out here. And it is, it's hidden in, in plain sight because now that something exists called Google, all this information is there, but people don't know to look for it. They don't know what keywords to put in there to retrieve it, but it's there, right? So as a, so, so now, Let's, let's, let's bring it full circle as we unfold this equity. Remember I showed you 18 year old Principal Gafele and then not long after he becomes a teacher because during that year, starting with that eight, starting with undergrad school at 23, I'm reading hundreds of books during the time of my undergrad years in history. I become a new creature. When I walk into that classroom as a first year teacher, I want y'all to hear me on this one. Think about it. I don't know much. Remember, I, I've done nothing with my life. All I know is my degree, which was marketing, which had nothing to do with, with what, what I was getting ready to So therefore, the only thing I know is African-American history. I hope you hear me. I don't, this, this, this vessel is empty. 
All I know is African-American history. I don't know anything else. So guess what? I walk into a classroom as a first year teacher. All I know is African-American history. So it became natural for me to infuse it into every content area that I taught because I didn't know better. Now that's eight, 1988, 89, 99. Now let's fast forward to 2020. Guess what's happening in the world? You already know. That's what everybody is going, to, is getting professional development to do. They're trying to find a way to infuse it into their instruction. Something that I did naturally because I didn't know better. Had I known better, I may not have done it that way. I hope that makes sense to you, right? So, so now with that said, let's, let's unpack this word equity. Do I bring an equity approach to my instruction? Well, remember, remember what social justice, we said the operative question is what is social justice education? Well here, what is an equity mindset teacher? Y'all remember this book here? Let me get it. Remember this? Mindset, Carol Dweck, growth mindset. Remember that? And everybody was saying, not yet, not yet, not yet. And, and you know how in the world of education, things come with a vengeance and then somewhere along the way they, they fade out and then something else comes and replace it and the, 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 the newfangled toy comes about and now here we on that and then that fades out and then here comes something else. With every fiber of my being, I will not let this word equity die. And I will not let that word, that, that term social justice education die because they should have been there from the start, right? So, so see with that word mindset, I said, well, mindset is not solely associated with growth. Mindset should be associated with equity. I don't just want equity practiced in a classroom. I want that teacher to have an equity mindset an equity attitude, not just become an equity practitioner, because I can be an equity practitioner without being an equity thinker, an equity attitude, an equity mindset. And that's the one that just does equity. No, I, I want equity to be who you are. See that those are two different instructors all together. Those are two different leaders all together. Those are two different people all together. When we make the distinction between am I an equity a practitioner or do I bring an equity mindset? Because see the one that brings the equity mindset, they don't need someone to teach them that, that of 25 students in a the classroom, they're all different. No, no one needs to teach that to someone with an equity mindset. That person is walking into that classroom fully cognizant of the fact that no two students are alike. So therefore that teacher needs the strategy to be able to manage a classroom right, as far as being that equitable, equitable practitioner for various different students, but that teacher doesn't need instruction to understand that I, I, I got this in the classroom. They're, they're in all different places and spaces. So therefore, I said, one has to be an equity mindset teacher. So, so what does that mean? Let's break it down. I told you before, I, when, if, I, if I can't find the definition I'm looking for, I'll, I'll create it, right? So that's, that's what we did here. So, so here I'm saying an equity mindset teacher is a teacher who utilizes a variety of developmentally appropriate instructional strategies that consider the different academic, social, and emotional needs of all the learners in a student-centered, culturally responsive, and culturally relevant equity mindset classroom where student individuality, student cultural identity, and student voice, in quotes, and I'll tell you why, matter exponentially. Oh man, y'all, that's a lot there. I spend four hours on this page sometime. Of course, we're not doing that today, but um, when I'm on location, if I'm doing like a six or eight hour presentation, we'll spend four just on this because, because there's so much there. There's so much there. Let's, 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 let me go all the way to the bottom of the screen first. Student individuality, student cultural identity, and student voice. I wanna go right to student voice. I got it in quotes and here's why. I'm using that word voice two ways. I'm saying in that classroom, does youngster have the opportunity, the capacity within the room to express oneself? 
in other words, do I matter? Do my views matter? Does my opinion matter? Does my thinking matter? Does my voice matter, right? So that's the literal, the ability to express oneself, but because it's in quotes, I'm looking at it another way. Voice, in that classroom, do I have the ability to find myself? See, think about the volume of young people who are in school, particularly at the high school level, who, who can go through four years of high school and graduate and still have no clue as to what direction they wanna go into. We know that those directions can change, we know that. But, but that's not the point here. The point here is there's something about that classroom where I am finding, I am identifying, I am locating my professional identity. See, that direction I may wanna go into, is there something about that classroom? Is there something about that equity mindset teacher that I'm starting to find my voice See, it took me reading history to find my educator voice. I, education wasn't on my radar. I laughed at people who were teachers. That, that, that wasn't on my radar. That's not what I wanted to do with my life. And a principal, are you kidding me? Right, so, but, but, but as, I, as I began to read history, it enabled me to find my voice, who I am, what I wanted to do. And I've been exercising this voice since 1984. See, when I, when, 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 when I first realized, I think I know what I want to do, right? So, so, so voice, but let's go back up where it says student individuality. Is each student, does each student have his or her own identity? And that, because see, you got, you got these two in terms of what I'm going to discuss today. You got the equality mindset teacher and you got the equity mindset teacher that equality mindset teacher that's the one that gets mad at me when i show up doing a to, 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 to do a professional development training on equity because the, because see the equality mindset is easy for the teacher it's like okay you're all the same here's the lesson either you get it or you don't and i have met enough teachers on the road who will say to me look Principal Gafele, you know, this This is like the meeting after the meeting. It's like when they when they outside in the parking lot waiting for you so they can have that one-on-one -on -one or that, that three-on-one, -on whatever it is, or, or at lunch when they want you to, hey, come sit with us at lunchtime. Because now now they could express themselves, right? So I, so, I, so you walk into the cafeteria, hey, hey, come and sit with us. All right, so I, okay, I'll sit with y'all. Gafele, look, I teach math. I, I can't, I hear what you're saying in the presentation this morning. I heard you, but look, I teach math. I mean, I've heard this so many times. I teach it the way I, I it was taught to me, right? So, so like, it's, it's on them. I'm not their counselor. I'm not their parent. I'm not their preacher. You know, I'm not their friend. I'm not their family. I'm their math teacher. And either they're going to get it or they're not going to get it. That's not my problem. Right. So now, so, so now I'm, I'm trying to enjoy my lunch and you just, you just pained me. Right. So, so now I got to sit there and be subjected to this and then have the conversation. So, so, so now I'm saying no math teacher, because although that's how you got it, it doesn't mean it was right. Right. And, but the times were different when you were in school, but see, we understand now research has shown us that just because, like, like, take for example, okay, so, so teacher, you got certain teacher students in your classroom who are high achievers, correct? Yes. Okay. And you've got certain students in your classroom who are low achievers, correct? Yes. Well, teacher, those low achieving students, they're potentially your valedictorians too, right? But they may not necessarily be processing the way that the other group is processing. See, it doesn't mean they're intellectually inferior. It just means that they it just means that their brain is going to process it differently from the way the other student's brain processed the information. Right. So you have to consider that. And see, like I said to you guys about 10 minutes ago, I'm gonna come back to that word at risk. So that lower achieving student, sometime we'll see that student as being at risk. I said, teacher, wait a minute. You better stop using that vanity right don't 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 use at risk that's like that's like being in some space using profanity where you got no business using it right what do you mean by that cafe lane 
because at risk is deficit speech. That's why. What do you mean? Meaning that if you articulate, if you utter at risk about a student or even to the student, but about a student, that means you're seeing that student through an at risk lens because the, 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 the words themselves are just the manifestation of the way you're thinking about that youngster. So you've got deficit speech that is rooted in deficit thinking. So now you're, you're not seeing that student as a high achiever. You're not seeing that student as, as a valedictorian. You're not seeing that student with a wealth of potential. You're seeing that student through a deficit lens that says you're at risk. So here comes a question, because no, you know, a lot of times we don't ask this question, at risk of what? What are we saying, right? And you're the teacher? And go back, going back to my question, are my students at an advantage because I am their teacher? So now let's 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 look at it in terms of the achievement data. National achievement data has black students, Latino students on the wrong side of, 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 of the spectrum, right? So now let's say in that classroom, so there are black students who someone labeled at risk, underperforming, underachieving, lacking motivation, all that. Are we gonna buy into that? Is that how we're going to see them? Because see, if 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 I'm using deficit speech, which is which is being rooted or anchored by deficit thinking, then if I've got two or more people who have deficit thinking, then I've got deficit culture in the building. So now youngsters are walking into a deficit culture, and when you've got a deficit culture in a school, it in turn puts the children at a deficit. The environment alone is doing them in, right? So it's so important that despite the fact that there are students who may be underperforming, that they still have the privilege of walking into an environment that is overwhelmingly positive and optimistic. I don't know what it is to walk into a building, to, to lead, I mean, let me change that, to lead a building, me that is negative and pessimistic. I don't know what that is. We're going to accentuate positivity. We're gonna create an environment where the youngster feels compelled to perform at a high level because the environment matters that that youngster walks into every day. You and I matter. And how are we perceiving that youngster? Let's take it, let's, let's, let's go a little bit deeper on it. Take a look there, you've all seen this. But I, I, I see it through a different lens. You know, we, we, we've all seen this, this, this graphic, I think. I know we saw that baseball game graphic, but we saw this one. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to go heavy. Let me, let, let's do this. Let's, let's take a break, right? I know I've been going two hours. I know you guys need a break. So, so Dr. Stark, let's, 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 do a, let's, let's do a hard 10. And then, and then I'm gonna go strong on, on, on the next uh, couple of slides. How's okay. that sound? Um, that sounds good. Um, we'll come back at, um, it's 11.05. 11.15. Sounds good. See you in a few minutes. Okay, get something to eat, drink, the other needs you have, <laughs> and we'll be back. <laughs> back. Oh, maybe they never left. Everybody seems to be right there. It's 11.15, and um, hey. Yes, yeah, that time. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, uh, time is moving, so let's... um. Let's jump into it. Uh, let me just get that off the screen for now. There we go. All right. Um, welcome back, everybody. That was a quick break. Just wanted to make sure that we put that we built it in there. But um, you know, I was reading the comments, and uh, I, you know, it's I'm, I'm in. A, I have a bad habit as a as a virtual presenter, and that is not necessarily reading comments the chat when i'm presenting because i get so wrapped up into the presentation but i always do during breaks i appreciate you all um a lot of good stuff there and the one i forgot the name i said i was going to memorize it but the one that said it's the best church service in a while yeah <laughs> appreciate you <laughs> yeah so let's um Let's take a look at the uh, the graphic here. You 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 all ha have had to have seen this, and you've seen variations of it. Some of them have the tree kind of tilting over to help the one that's the shortest, and so on and so forth. So there are various different ways that this is used, but I don't need those variations. This this 
this picture is perfect for me in terms of my explanation. So you'll notice that I have a blank screen on the left-hand side because I've got a lot to say text-wise that, that you'll see in a little while. But first, let me, let me talk about this one. We're, we're in that equity mindset part of the discussion. And I'm, and I'm looking at the equality side first. So this picture, and it was in, matter of fact, let me just give you a little backdrop. I used to use that baseball picture, you know, when they had the three people in the outfield and they got looking over the outfield fence and they need the crates to stand on to be able to see the game. And I was using it for probably over a year. And every time I used it, the, the audience didn't know, but I knew I was cringing while using it because it, I, I, I knew that there were things missing that I needed in the picture. So one day I'm just on the internet looking for something that had nothing to do with equity. And this showed up and I said, bam, I'm stealing that right off the web. And, and, and I've been using it ever since this in the equity screen. And now I can make my point. So let's, let's talk about it. Um, here you've got the first, the literal, you got three individuals who each want to reach an apple, but neither of them can. So they give them each a crate to stand upon. And now as a result of having a crate to stand upon, one can reach, but two continue to not be able to reach. But the thing about it is I can't stop at reaching an apple because I don't know that people just go around trying to reach apples for the sake of reaching apples. You reach an apple to do something with the apple. You may reach it to in order to eat it. You may reach it in order to give it to somebody else. You may reach it in order to sell it, right? So, so there, there, there's a variety of things that you can do with the apple once you attain it. So here I'm saying, I, I wanna use the example here of eating the apple. So, so now the taller one who has the crate can reach the apple and thereby eat the apple, but then it goes further. Because ultimately, although some sometimes we eat because we just enjoy eating, but ultimately we eat in order to live. So now he can reach the apple in order to eat the apple in order to live and thereby survive, right? So, but then you have the one in the middle. We gave that one the same thing, a crate. And now it, when you put it in the context of living, this one, the, the probability for long life decreases because I don't have access to food. I want you to hear me now. I don't have access to food because I can't, I can't reach it. But then you got this third one on the right who also does not have access, right? So see the one on the left, I can eat. But we gave each of them the same thing. But the same thing for each individual is not going to work for each individual. See, I always say, and we, we, you know, we, we gonna go hard on equity right now, equity and equality. I say, you know, equity, I mean, equality, we, we can never be in a classroom where equal, or have a classroom or leaders that are watching allow, uh, uh, allow for, or, 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 or um, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't find the word right now, it'll come to me. But we can't, I'll use the word allow because I can't find the word allow for equality to be the vehicle for to success i know the word i was looking for celebrate we can't we we, we can't celebrate equality yeah, that's what i was looking for so equality is the end game the big picture goal but it's not the vehicle to get there see so now here the vehicle use was equality and two thirds of the whole cannot eat, right? Cannot access the apple, may not be able to live a long life because I don't have access to food, right? So now that's, but, but see, that's the, the literal. Now let's go to the figurative and put it and make this a classroom. So now each individual represents seven students. They got 21 students in the classroom. So now the teacher gives a lesson. That crate that you see that they're standing on, that's the lesson. The uh, mastery of the lesson or the objective is the apple. So now the lesson has been taught and seven students, the ones represented by the one on the left, they understood, they comprehended, they mastered, right? They got it.
But the same lesson was given to the ones in the middle. That's another group of seven. They don't understand. Teacher might say, why not? Were you focused? Were you attentive? Did you do the homework? Have you been studying? Are you prepared? And wh whatever else they could ask them. But, but why haven't you got, un why are you not understanding this lesson as your peers on the left did, those seven? But then you got the ones on the right. They didn't understand either. And now once again, the questions, why aren't you understanding? I gave you what I gave your peers that understood. They got it. Why aren't you getting it? An equality mindset, that will be the thinking. They got it. Why aren't you getting it? And thereby, what is it that you're not doing that they are doing? See, that's how that equality mindset works. So, so we're seeing them all as, be, we're lumping them together. And if one group got it, you should be getting it. You should be getting it. And if you're not getting it, then it's like that math teacher I talked about before the break. It must be you. I'm teaching it the way I got it, right? It, there must be something with you that you're not processing. So the, when we talk about that equality mindset, it, it becomes problematic using that as an example. So now here, with that being 21 students, we're talking 14 students who are not understanding. And there are no accommodations being made. So in terms of the text, let's take a look at it. Go to the left-hand side of the screen. With this particular graphic, there's a reality with that, that he, using that particular graphic, there's a reality in this equality mindset classroom. Four realities. Number one, student individuality, student cultural identity, and student voice obscurity slash invisibility. Nobody sees it. Or they're obscure, they're a blur, right? Because we've lumped everybody together. They're all the same. I don't see the black student. I don't see the white student. I don't, I don't see the struggling student economically speaking. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see the Asian student. I just see my babies. I just see my students. Why are we having this conversation? Because teacher. There are implications along racial ethnic lines. There are implications along cultural lines. There are, there, are, there are the isms of the world that can never be discounted. They always have to be taken into consideration in terms of who that student is that has walked into that classroom or has logged onto that computer doing virtual, virtual learning. Student individuality, student cultural identity. Let me, let me see what time it is first, okay. Let me, let me, let me share with you this scenario. My wife is uh, sitting right, right over here with me, near me. And I remember um, in 2018, she and I went to, uh, we went to Boston where I was doing a presentation. So we got there a day early. So I said to her, let's, let's go downtown and take in some colonial Boston history, right? So we went on downtown. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I was very specific in what I was looking for. So we started, so we got to the area which is called King Street. The, the, the history buffs in, on this call, you will know what I mean by King Street. So we were on King Street and we started searching and roaming for the same thing. So we're searching, we're roaming. I'm asking her, does she see it? She asked me, do I see it? And we don't see it. So then we go inside. I said, let's go inside and ask somebody in charge, right? Now, let me tell you what I'm looking for as it relates to this student individuality, student, for, actually I'm on student cultural identity. So I'm looking for a marker or a monument for where Crispus Attucks died. Do you know that name? Crispus Attucks was a black man. He was the first person to die for America's independence. He happened to be black. He died on March the 5th, 1770 on King Street, where he was, where, where, where he was shot. So from, by, by someone from England. So now 
that became known as the Boston Massacre, right? So now, because he's black and I'm black, I wanted to see where's the marker, where's the monument, where's the memorial to Crispus Attucks who, who died on this street for America's independence for, um, from Britain. Now I want y'all to hear me well, you know, Dr. Stark was talking about the courageous conversation. In terms of Boston colonial history, culturally speaking, there's absolutely nothing there that I can identify with, nor do I have an interest in along racial ethnic lines, because that's a, por that's a portion of history that represents some, some of the harshest times for black people in this country, right? So, so there's nothing about colonial Boston that I'm going to identify with and get excited about, nothing. However, there's this one little piece called Crispus Attucks. So I'm looking for something relative to him, student cultural identity, because that's the one piece that I can identify with. So there's nothing there. We go inside, we ask questions. Where's the monument to Crispus Attucks? The person, here's what the person says to me. I don't know. But he died out here, I said to him, right on King Street. He died right in front of this building, somewhere. We were in the courthouse, which is now a museum. Uh, let me ask somebody else. So they found somebody else. He said, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's down this street somewhere. I said, nah, he didn't die down that street. He died on King Street, right? So now I'm frustrated. I want you guys to hear me. I'm frustrated because the piece of history that I can identify with culturally is missing. So therefore I don't see evidence of myself in what I'm looking at right now. It doesn't mean I can't have appreciation of other people's history. But when we talk about Boston colonial history, then we're talking about a history that's rooted in oppression as it relates to people of color. Right, so so therefore, I'm not going to feel pride in that history. You know, you talk about it. Uh, 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 um, uh, you, you talk about uh, Freedom Summer, Cheney Goodwin, and and, uh, and 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 so forth that were, that were died that, that were killed down in uh, they died down in um, in Mississippi. In, in Schwerner, okay, I, I I I can get into that. Who happened to be white? But 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 I, Goodwin and Schwerner, but 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 because they died in terms of trying to be an asset to black people, right? So, but when you talk about colonial Boston, Boston colonial history, that's, that's a different story altogether, right? So, so now I'm saying here in a classroom, in that equality mindset classroom, that individuality is compromised. That student cultural identity is compromised. That student voice, as I explained it before, becomes compromised. That youngster runs the risk of being obscure in that classroom. That youngster runs the risk of being invisible in that classroom. But then number two, culturally neutral. I gotta move you guys picture, there we go. Culturally neutral, culturally generic relations with students. Man. So as teacher, do I, do, I, do I understand that there are culture, there is cultural diversity in my classroom? And because we're not the same, doesn't make me, doesn't put me on a hierarchy, uh, you know, superior to you and, and you inferior to me, culturally speaking, but just, we're just, we, we, we're just coming from two different places. But, but, but as far as culturally, we can have appreciation for one another but I've got to learn who you are culturally so I, can, so, I, so I can put myself in better position to connect with you. It's like, here's an example I can use with you. Um, my audiences are, are all very different. And sometimes I'll go to a place and, and let, let, here's, here's the example I want to give you. Right before the pandemic, I was in, I was in Detroit right before the pandemic. It's one of the last presentations I did before, before everything shut down. And I had a morning program and I had an afternoon program to do, an evening, a morning, a, no, a full day and an evening. 
the full day was administrators from suburban schools, not in Detroit proper, but su surrounding suburbs. And the room was about 95% or more white, right? So it's nothing I'm not accustomed to. I did my presentation, right? There was a smattering of, of, of black administrators there, but it's primarily white. I did my presentation and then I was done. They said for your evening presentation, you're gonna be working with the inner city Detroit principals. They black, right? They said, uh, and, 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 and because it was evening, that meant they had worked all day as opposed to being in a PD all day. So they worked all day, dinner was served and so forth. So they got there before I did. I walked into the room. When I walked into the morning room, they were sitting there like real quiet waiting for me. When I got into this room, culturally, it was a very different environment. It was very vocal. It was very, it was, it was, it was a lot of movement. It was just, it, it, it was a different world from that morning group, right? So now I'm looking at them and I realize I'm in Detroit and they worked all day long and they're working in, some, some of them are working in some tough urban schools. I said, I can't be who I was this morning. I'm gonna lose them. It ain't gonna work. So now I, it's time to get started and I'm looking. And I'm sensing, I said, man, I got five, I got like 10 seconds to get this thing right. Or it's, it's, it's it, them people ain't gonna be paying me a bit of mind because they've been working for 12 hours, right? And they loud, they talking to each other, they doing all that stuff. I got in there, I was so loud. I know I was preaching a sermon and it worked for me. Here's my point. I mean, they gave me a standing ovation, right? And it wasn't even that type of, it wasn't even that type of event, right? Here's my point. Culturally, I knew I better adapt to both audiences. I can't like 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 I speak in places like Montana, Utah, Idaho. I'm I'm getting ready to go to South Dakota if this virus goes away, um, in in May or June, whatever whatever it is on my calendar. That audience is a different audience from 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 Detroit and Cleveland. In, in Miami, Miami Dade, uh, parts of Louisville, you know, it's it's a different audience. And if I try to be generic and just come in and be the same guy with each audience, like when I just said the same guy with each audience, the people up in my town get scared, right? Because how do I know? Because I did it, I, I slipped, right? And I I could look at him like oh, this dude man, he's a little loud, right? So. I'm saying I'm 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 saying to you, it works the same way in the classroom. You got to know your audience. See, when we said we're talking about being culturally neutral, culturally generic, your children, just like when I use the word audience with with a, a, a real a true audience, like, such as yourselves, the students are the audience. I never show up to an event late. I get there before the audience because I'm going to study them as they're walking in. I'm going to listen to the conversations. I'm going to see, do black educators and white educators sit together or do the black educators sit on one side and the white educators sit, because because that happens in places I go. All black educators gravitate together. Latino graduate educators gravitate together. The white educators gravitate together. So I'm going to come in there, I'm going to analyze that because it tells me a lot about that district and it tells me a lot about that leadership. So I'm going, and, but then I'm gonna eavesdrop on some of the conversation. I'm gonna see who, like, I'm not gonna hear the specificity, but I'm gonna see who's laughing, who's serious. I, so by the time they introduce me, I'm gonna have some understanding and awareness of the audience I'm about to speak to. Well, the teacher has to do the same thing. You got to know your audience and you're not gonna solely learn your audience in the classroom. As I said earlier, you got to know that youngster outside of the classroom. I mean, you need to know that youngster in the cafeteria because that youngster may be somebody different in that cafeteria. You got to know that youngster in the on the playground. You got to know that young, and if you can, you got to know that youngster at home. I'm not gonna say you have to do that, but I'm gonna say if you can, oh man, it gets sweeter because now you really know 
that youngster. So that now culturally we can still connect as opposed to me seeing you as being neutral and, and, and lumping you all together. And now this is just my generic classroom and we've got these generic relations. See, I don't wanna do that. I wanna, I, I wanna know you so that I know how to talk to you. I had a, I had a situation um, where, I'm not even gonna give you the specifics, it's too, it's too, I haven't processed it yet, but, but I'll say this to you. It was a microaggression. And, 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 and I know that the person that, that said it to me had no clue of how I was going to receive it. I know that, right? They meant no harm. But because of the way my eyes look at the world, and, 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 and the way I received the world, I said, when I read it, I said, when I saw it, I said, ouch. And maybe at some point I will let the person know, you know, you said something that you may want to reconsider if you ever say it to anybody else again, right? So, but that culturally neutral, culturally generic relations with students, it, it doesn't work, right? Number three, because it, 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 it all falls, falls under that equality mindset umbrella. Culturally neutral, culturally generic pedagogy. So now children have to go through school and, 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 and never see where curriculum and instruction tie into them. If, like I said to you two hours ago, if I'm not relevant, you don't hear me because I'm, I'm not meeting your need. I'm on, you only hear me if I'm relevant. Well, it's the same thing with so many young people in the classroom. Of course, you'll always have breakthroughs of young people who can sit there bored out of their mind and still excel. Right. But 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 I'm talking about the masses, the larger numbers and sitting in a classroom who are who are absolutely brilliant, because when you see them in areas of interest. Right. Like like people, are, you know, it's, it's cliche now, but people always talk about man, if they could if they could learn the math the way they learn the rap lyrics. Right. But but the, but the rap lyric is an area of interest. Right. So so it's easy to learn the lyric because I'm interested in this. So, so I, I'll see, I'll see um, younger adults, you know, twenties, thirties, and 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 can recite the whole song because of some old school song that they haven't heard in a long time, but yet it's still there because it's an area of interest. So I'm saying to you, in a culturally neutral, culturally generic, uh, pedagogical classroom, youngsters in a classroom where, where's me? And, and, and we're not saying give give youngster a curriculum that 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 addresses all of, all of his likes and interests. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what is it about that curriculum that I see me in it? Let me give you let me let me give you an object lesson on this one. Man, that time is moving. I wasn't going to do this, but I want to do it. Take a look at this here. Let's call this a photograph. Let's say it's all of you. I got all of you on the screen. I took a screenshot and then I, I got your phone numbers, your cell numbers, and I text the, the, the photo to your phone. And here it is. And here's all of you in the photo, right? You, you, your phone rang or vibrated. You, you, you took your phone out. You see, oh, Kefele sent us a picture, sent us something. Let me see what it is. You open it up and there's you in this picture. I guarantee you, I promise you. 99.9% .9 of you that are on this call right now, 214 of you it, all together. When you look at the picture, 99.9 .9 of 100% of you are going to look for yourself first. Why? Because the most relevant person in the photo is you. Everybody else, I mean, there could be important people in your life in the photo, but you'll probably catch them secondarily because you didn't know I took the screenshot. So now you know, man, this guy's a speaker. He probably posts the stuff online. Let me see how I look, right? So, so, so you're going to go to you, see, man, make sure I look right, man. He got to put this thing on the front street. He got all them followers. Oh my God. So, so now, then you look at other people secondarily, right? Cause that's that's like human nature, but the, but like but like I said, ninety nine point nine. Cause somebody might look at somebody else first, right? We won't make it completely absolute, but but here's the thing: children. Now watch this: children walk into classrooms every day or online. Let's just put it in the school for the sake of this discussion. So they walk into the building, and the teacher, as they're walking in the room, has got this 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 ritual 
of giving them a class picture that was taken the day before. So, so the, teacher, the, the students are walking into the room, teacher says, here's your picture. Here's your picture. Good morning. 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 Here's your picture. So now they all got a picture. And then they sit down and they take a look at it. And they say, wait a minute, teacher. When you took that picture yesterday, one of them, one of them becomes a spokesperson. They say, when you took that picture yesterday, I was sitting right here. And another one said, and I was sitting right here. And another one said, and I was sitting right here. And another one said, and I was sitting right here. And then collectively, they said, hey, teacher, when you took the group photo yesterday, we were here. Why did you cut us out of the photo? Why, why did you cut us out? Now, let me make this very clear when we talk about culturally neutral, culturally uh, generic pedagogy. These are your children of color right now. And they're saying, teacher, why did you cut us out of the class photo? And the teacher kind of looks at them, puzzled, and says, huh, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I, I'm sorry. And I promise you, it won't happen again. Now, for sake of time, let me tell you what I just did. Your picture was a real picture. Their picture I'm using symbolically for curriculum and instruction. Curriculum and instruction has them missing from the photo. They're missing. They're not there. And they're asking the question, why am I not there? Why am I absent from this lesson? Why is there no representation of me? Why is this so foreign from who I am? See, I'm saying, and I've been saying this for a long time, a curriculum, let's, let's take this photo and turn it into a curriculum. A curriculum is nothing but a lifeless document. That's all it is. That master teacher is not concerned about a culturally irrelevant curriculum. That master teacher is not concerned about that because that master teacher understands that this is nothing but a document. That master teacher knows far more than a curriculum will ever contain. So that master teacher simply takes the curriculum and does this. breathes life into it. And now when that curriculum says, Thomas Edison, that master teacher said, Lewis Latimer, Ivan Van Sertima, Blacks in Science. See, that's what the master teacher did. Master teacher still taught curriculum, but the master teacher brought so much more to that curriculum and enriched the education that those young people are receiving. Number four, reality in the equality mindset classroom, conducive environment for teachers unconscious, implicit and or explicit biases to exist. Man, we have taken a class of young people and brought them together as this one monolithic unit that means that there are biases bouncing off the floor to the ceiling and off the wall to wall. It's just bouncing all over the place like, like, like a bunch of basketballs continuously bouncing around the room and the teacher is not privy. Teacher doesn't realize what's going on because the teacher has that equality mindset. I just brought them all together. I don't see race. I don't see ethnicity. I don't see culture. I don't see socioeconomic. I don't, I don't see that. I just see children. That's very, that's very noble of you, teacher. I understand. I mean, I, that's no, I applaud you. However, it's problematic. See, and that always has to be considered. It's problematic. Um, and, and you know something, y'all? I'm gonna try to build in like five minutes to get to any questions, comments, or concerns that anybody has at the end. Five or ten minutes. So let me let me let me talk faster and and and, and keep going. So 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 with this particular reality, and this is I, I call this a harsh reality. For a classroom and and when i'm wearing the consultant's hat because i wear it often 
meaning that I get to go to schools on school days as opposed to a PD day, I get to go into classrooms and see these four realities exist. It's because they're blatant, you can see them. And then here's the potential outcomes when that is the reality. Number one, student learning, you can, you can bet the house is gonna suffer. And particularly since I put this in, in, in racial ethnic lines, black and Latino students are gonna suffer in this environment. This is, this is not a good environment for black and Latino students to be students within at all, right? It's a harsh environment, right? It's an oppressive environment, right? So student learning is gonna suffer, but, on, but, but also disproportionality and disciplinary referrals is, is, is gonna be a reality. So, so a lot of schools, in fact, I, I could almost say most schools that I attend, they're, they're, there are problems with behavior, right? The, the excessive number of disciplinary referrals. And then when, when I ask for the demographic breakdown, then, 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 then they'll tell me, um, you know, to show me the data, it's, it's black students, it's Latino students, they're the ones who are being suspended, they're the ones that be put placed in detention, all that kind of stuff. I so said, you got disproportion, you got disproportionality in how you handle discipline, which, which I don't even like the word discipline, right? Um, which maybe I need to tell you why since I said it, and I will in a second. See, so, so you got disproportionality because you got these four realities. Of course, you're going to have discipline problems in that classroom, or of course, you're going to have perceived discipline problems in that classroom because these four realities are salient within that classroom. But when I say, I said that word discipline, man, I better be quick with this. See, you go into a classroom and there's a wall, there's a wall on the chart, a chart on the wall that says rules. So rules and consequences. I say, see, that's, that's part of that equality mindset, rules and consequences. Because, because just the word rules alone is problematic. Rules. I think about who the schools are built for. They're not built for you and I. When they build these schools, they're not thinking about us. These schools are built for children. Right, we're just, so, so we, we're teachers, we're valuable, but we work there. Those children, they're there to learn. So, so I'm saying, therefore, why would I have rules for your house? That's like I go, like one of you invite me into your house. I go to your house and I say, here's the rules for your house. See, it's their house. It doesn't mean I'm, it doesn't mean I'm going to allow a lack of order. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, I don't wanna use the word rules. I wanna talk about norms. I wanna talk about expectations. I wanna talk about values, right? See, see, that's what I wanna talk about. Cause see, when I talk about rules, then what I'm doing is I'm saying, here's what you cannot do. Here's what you cannot do. And if you do do these things, here's what's gonna to happen to you. See, I, I mean, what, a, what in that conversation makes a student excited? Like, oh my God, this is good. Like, like, like the first day of school, Principal says, make sure you go over the rules. If you need to do it for two days or three days, you got my permission, Hit, hammer them with them rules. So now the children been away for two months for summer break. Some of them may have gone on vacation, depend, just depending on their circumstances, just had a great summer. Some of them might just had a great summer just hanging out, right? Now they come back to school and they walk into the classroom. The rules, take a look at the chart. This is, this, this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And if you do it, this is what's gonna happen to you. And now the student, you, you think the student's supposed to be sitting there saying, oh, wow, this is so exciting. I can't wait for tomorrow to hear more of this. This is good stuff. No, who wants to come back to that? You, 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 you sabotage the year on the first day of school because you put all the emphasis on the rules instead of bringing some love in that classroom. So, you know, just, 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 just something inspiring. It's like, so the youngster be like, oh man, I like this. I like this teacher. I can't wait to get back here tomorrow. As a principal, I would do the welcome back message. Man, I ain't talking about no rules coming back from, I got, I got hundreds of kids in the, auditor, in the gym. I'm not talking about rules. I'm, I'm talking about what we getting ready to do. My emphasis on that speech is we getting ready to achieve the impossible. We ain't talking about no rules. First day you back and I'm talking about how I'm gonna punish you. And then you supposed to be exciting about my vision for the school. Come on, it's a contradiction, right? So then, so, so, so now you, you take, because I, I, I wanna stay in that, in, in, in that racial ethnic space. So now, you, so, so now you're looking at students of color, you're looking at black students, Latino students, and, 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 and you're looking at the reality of being black, right? The reality of being Latino and all that's entailed there. And then I come to this space that's supposed to be a safe space. And I got somebody telling me that I'm gonna be punished instead of, 
eliminating or eradicating whatever the potential issue could be by being proactive. See, but see, that's 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 all skill set. But then you flip this, the equity side, man, that's a, oh my God, the time is racing. I got to talk fast, man. I don't know how I'm going to get the Q&A in. Y'all going to have to forgive me on that one. Listen, so you got the equity side. I don't have to explain this the way I did the equality because, because the way I explain the equality is self-explanatory, right? So now, but I want to, but I want to look at the, the, the figure, the uh, figurative, that's a classroom. So now you got 21 students. The crate is the lesson. The apple is the objective has been met. So now, so seven students met the objective on the lesson as given. But the teacher says, I got, I got 14 other students who don't necessarily process, learn, make sense out of information the way the first seven did. It doesn't mean they're intellectually inferior. It means they learn differently. So now let me, let me, so now let me, uh, comment, let me account for them and make sure that I deliver in a way that that middle group gets it as well. Because now, and then that third group, let me account for them to make sure that they get it as well. Because now the end goal, equality, they there. I got 100% of my students achieving excellence because I use a different vehicle to get there. See, see, I, I want equality. It's just not my vehicle. You know, so, 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 so the vehicle is going to be different. Right. Like you think about some people are into like cars. Right. Like like some 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 of y'all might be into like like I got to have a high end car. Right. I'm not. Right. I don't know what it is to own a high end car. Right. I, I just don't. That's not my. And then I, I roll up there in my Jeep. Right. So now here's the thing. If, if we all go into the same place, I'm in my Jeep. Next person in there hoopty. Right. Next person ain't in their bangs. Next person ain't in their whatever. We all going to get there. It's just that we took different vehicles to get to the same place. But once we in there and we inside, ain't nobody thinking about what kind of car you got. Like, 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 like right now, let's say it's, it's King Day. So let's, we go into a King celebration, a Dr. MLK King celebration. So now once we in the church, we ain't talking about what car got us there. We hope the pastor going or the preacher, the, the speaker going to bring a good message. See what I'm saying? So, 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 so therefore, we have to make sure that, yes, we want to get there, but make sure the vehicle is the right vehicle for each individual so that we could get to the same place. Equality being the big picture goal. So, 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 so the language, reality, student individuality, student cultural identity, student voice, distinctiveness, visibility, I'm somebody in that classroom. I matter in that classroom. Cultural responsive relations with students. I'm inverting everything I said about, said in the last one under, under equality. So now we take into consideration. We got differences here. And I'm gonna appreciate those differences. Not trying, not, not trying to suppress who you are and bring you to who, who I am. Culturally relevant pedagogy. Oh man. I say to teachers, I say every lesson you teach, I say this all the time, every lesson you teach, I don't care what it is, you have got to consider who's sitting in that classroom. A generic lesson is not going to cut it. You got to consider who's in there and how do I craft this lesson in a way that this youngster can relate to it, identify with it, claim it, own it, embrace it. It's mine. It's got to be considered in that lesson plan development. Teacher's willingness to embrace possible biases. What, so teacher says, look, I think I've been biased. I, I'm open. School me. Educate me, talk to me. I, I'm I'm willing because I don't want to bring bias to my students. I want to be able to see my students for who they are. See, that's that equity mindset, teacher. That's a different mindset. And then the and then the potential outcome. Number one, student high academic performance. Man, you, you, you put a student in this classroom, there's there's a there's a much higher potential for student high academic performance there. And then, and then the, the climate and culture just healthy over an overall healthy classroom 
learning environment when you've got a classroom like this one, right? Now, I, I, oh my God, let me, let, me, let me give you this contact information. Man, I wish I had like 15 more minutes. But um, this is me. If you want the handout, go to principalcafele.com on the top, le top left and uh, go to my website, click the email address. I don't put it on the screen because I want you to visit that website because I got all sorts of resources on the site that you don't have to pay for. So just such as video and blogs and articles and all that kind of stuff. So go to the website, click the email address. And then if you're on Twitter or Facebook, well, forget Facebook. If you're on Twitter, follow me at Principal Cafele. And then, uh, well, Facebook at Principal Cafele, follow, but you can't friend me right because i don't have friend space just follow me but then those Dr. of you in leadership Dr. give Dr. me one half second those, those, I'm almost done those of you in leadership um just uh join me on saturday mornings which is tomorrow morning at, 10, at 11 o'clock eastern i do the virtual assistant principal leadership academy on twitter live facebook live and youtube live at the channel called virtual assistant principal leadership academy but you can you don't have to go there on youtube and go to twitter or facebook and i'm on at 11 o'clock for an hour and we're just talking school leadership and then you see my um my youtube channels and you see my books and they're the books on the bottom there certainly uh was on ascd or barnes and noble.com so take a picture of that and I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Dr. Stark. And I wanna thank you guys for the opportunity to spend three, for me, short hours mm -hmm. um, with you guys talking. Hey, Dr. Dr. Kefali, um, for those who have Q&A, those who can stay, yeah. are welcome to stay to ask any questions um, if you have additional minutes. Um, so um, again, I know some have to leave, but those who want to stay, then feel free. So if you have a question for Dr. Kefali, then um, he's available. I'm here. I took took the uh, I took um the share down so I could look at you. Anybody? Anything on your mind? Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Anything? Don't be, don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Um, once again, thank you all for being here today. But again, if you have a question, please don't hesitate. Um, you hear somebody? I know somebody has a question. Please don't let me have to call on someone. <laughs> Miss Octavia Acklin from Shelby County. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is Judy Lippman still there? Okay, that's Octavia. Okay. If, if, I don't know if Judy's still there, but Judy, I, I appreciate what you wrote on here. <laughs> appreciate you immensely. Hello. Hello. I am still here. Dr. Uh, Principal Cafela, yes. And Judy Dr. Lippman is there? I'm yeah. here. Can you hear me? I hear you, Judy. I appreciate what you wrote here. It's okay. Great, well, I got to tell you something. For a, long time, life. <laughs> for a long time in my life, in my professional life, I coordinated a violence prevention program that was written without African-American input. And through the years, at the time and since then, I've been so conscious of what we're telling kids to do, to walk away from a fight, to say this or do that. And they'd say, I can't walk away from a fight. I can't lose face. I can't do that. And we had no answers. And it felt so inadequate and wrong. And boy, do I wish I had the wherewithal back then to change things and get different lessons taught, different input, different mindset for me. So I repeat to you, thank you. This is valuable to me now, but to everybody. We all need this, especially white people. I appreciate you. And let, let, me, let me just address that, um, the very short version, Dr. Stark, of what you said about the walking away from it. Um, you know, my why, was 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 the young men. I only I didn't become a teacher because I wanted to teach content areas. That that was secondary. I became a teacher because I wanted to build men. That was it. That was my sole reason that I entered the ranks of of of, um, of education. So once I became a so 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 therefore I had this particular focus. Doesn't mean I neglected my girls at all. But I had this particular focus, they were my why. But when I became a principal, then I built a, a school-wide model called Young Men's Empowerment Program. So now with that being a real issue, Judy, now I've got my young men, we, we're spending like hours of time with them each week and making up work that we miss. We put them in shirt and tie, slack shoes and a belt. We brought in speakers from the outside in the outside community. We didn't have to pay them a dime because they wanted to be in the school with my young men. And now we can address those kinds of issues with them directly, right? So see, 
because because see my my school was infested with I got my school was all Bloods, Crips, Grapes, Latin Kings, and MS 13s That's who we were, right? So okay. so so fights could jump off, but I said, but that's okay. Let's let's have the conversation that a father would typically have with a son that that most of my boys are not having. So they're having conversation with guys in the street. So now as they're having this conversation, it's giving them a different way to think about life, right? Because we, because we gave them that form, we gave them that platform and they began to change. Test scores, 100% proficiency, right? So, so, we, so we took care of that, um, but it's because of those, those heavy duty conversations on a regular basis. Hallelujah. Hey, thank you, uh, Ms. Allen, thank is, you. Ms. Ackland is ready. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't have a question. I just have a, a real comment. I was the one that made, I made the remark about, I felt like I was in church and getting a good, a good sermon. <laughs> um, yeah, the, this presentation is brought about, about a lot of reflection about where we are um, as a school district and, and just some, we, we, we have to do some deep searching so that we can get together and, and move forward and really take a, an in-depth look at equity and, and the children of color that we serve. Um, it's easy to, to view a presentation and get it, but you gotta have follow-up. Yeah. Um, and you have to be ready for those uncomfortable conversations that are gonna come because of a presentation like this. And so to you, I just wanna thank you um, a lot of my colleagues and principals are on here and oh. we have been texting back and forth the whole time. Well, um, I, I appreciate that. <clears throat> and as Thank a matter you. of fact, real, real quick, uh, if, if, if your leadership colleagues are still on here, let me just say this to you real quick. You see, you, you just said it. I'm just going to reinforce it. You, you got to go back. And I want to, I want to, I want to strongly encourage you. If you're not on my Saturday talks, to get on my Saturday talks. That's one thing. Cause see the the all the, the, the restraints are off. Then see, I'm not working for somebody. Then that that's me. So now it's like I'm going to let it ride. And, and we're talking social justice tomorrow, coupled with I did it last week in the wake of January 6, and then we're going to continue that tomorrow. But here's the thing: as leaders. We have, to, I, don't, I don't care what the politics of a district are. And I'm not talking about Jefferson County, I'm just, I'm speaking generic. As a leader, we have to have the spine, the courage, the backbone to engage our staff in the most difficult conversation. I don't, I don't, I don't care what the district is. Be, because we made the decision that we want to lead. See, see, don't make that decision if, if we're going to get in there and now I got to compromise my values, right? If, 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 if your values, because see, man, I feel like I'm getting ready to preach. Because see, your, your values of, of what got you in there, your values said, I'm preaching, forgive me, I'm, I'm feeling this. Your values is what made you want to be a principal in the first place or a leader in the first place. You said, I want to get in that school because I want to transform things. And then you get in there and then you scared to do it. See, 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 you can't get in there and then you're scared to do it. You got to do that, which drove you to get into that position in the first place. But you got to use tact. You have to have people skills because you got people that are coming from all different ways of thinking, right? So, so therefore, I'm going like, like, here's the book right here. I got, see, the, the books that I like really need to grab, they're not in the shelf. They're like sitting right here. How to Win Friends and Influence People by, by Dale Carnegie, written in like 1936. This book is still relevant, right? Because it's not a book about winning friends, it's a book about winning people to, a, to, to your way of thinking. So see, I can't, you, you, you and I can't talk to everybody the same way. You and I can't be the who we want to be in every staff meeting. So we got to consider, well, but who's sitting in the staff meeting? So, so, so how do I go about connecting with them? Because equity has to abound in every classroom in the building. Social justice education has to abound in every classroom in the building. Cultural relevance, cultural responsiveness have to abound in every classroom in the building. So therefore, as leader, I've got to consider that in terms of those relations. I've never had a staff that was predominantly black, right? My, my staffs have always been predominantly white, but the students have been predominantly black. Okay, no problem. Let me first undo a lot of that stuff they got in undergrad school, right? And now, and that's including some of my black teachers, right? And now let me remold, reshape by exposing them to information. 
to authors that they that, that they previously had never been exposed to. So that now they can look at our world, meaning the classroom, through a different lens than the lens that they were looking at it before I got there. So now it makes sense. So now, like, so for example, if Bri uh, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, to every staff member in that building, right? The, regardless of race, they know what Kefele gonna be doing the next day? They know that. And they, they, they appreciate that, right? Because those discussions are rich and they translate into academic performance, right? But it's just a matter, it's, it's, it's this, people skills, gotta have them, right? Because, because, because managing a staff is not an easy thing to do. Appreciate that. Hey, we have a question from um, Bruce Poteet. How do we prove that even if we are not from the same culture, that we want to help the student who has dealt with cultural injustice. Yeah. That's from Bruce. I appreciate that, Bruce. See, see, see. It, it, you know, it, it's as cliche as it is, it's still real and relevant. And that word is relationship. See, see, see you, you got to be genuine. And, and see, it's not so much what you say about yourself that I'm genuine. It's, 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 it's the way the student is perceiving you. Uh, are, are, are you genuine in the eyes of that student? Are you authentic in the eyes of this student that you are real? Like, like I could say that you really care about me, but I got a better word for that. It's slang, no. That you are really down with me. See, are you down with me, right? And see, that's what's gotta come across in your, relation, in your relationship with young people, right? So that's not you telling a youngster, I'm in your corner, I'm down with you. Youngster will make that, make, make that judgment based on who you are in relationship to the youngster. Youngster will be able to figure that out. Like, like you and I, we know who's down with us, right? And we know who's opposed to us. We know that. They don't have to tell us, I'm not feeling you, Cafe Lake. I'm not down with you. They don't have to tell us that. We know that based on how they present themselves to us. So I'm saying here, it's the, it's the same thing in terms of that relationship with that student that that student sees they okay i'm dealing with injustice i'm dealing with social racial injustice do you care about that teacher and if and if you do care in what ways are you demonstrating that okay. student will, will be able to figure that out hey jonathan mahan has a question i see that yeah jonathan yes uh principal kafili how are you i'm good how you doing good i'm doing well so i am an aspiring school leader uh, and I'm in a program uh, that's tied to our district here in Jefferson County. Uh, and so we, uh, I'm in a culture course right now. So how did you start building that culture of equity? Oh, excuse me, I just have a newborn baby here. Oh, congratulations. Uh, so how did you build that uh, culture of equity? How did you start that process uh, when you got to your first school? Yeah, great question. You know, it's, it, it was about those, those difficult conversations and, and not shying away from them. And, and not just me preaching at a staff meeting, but, but now turning, turning that discussion over to staff and having them discuss it amongst themselves, but not letting them necessarily sit with their buddies. Because then that means only buddies know one another on the staff. I, I gotta break that up. So now we, we, we got you sitting with strangers and engaging in a tough conversation, me being very much cognizant of the people skill aspect again, because I cannot afford for them to leave that meeting angry with one another or angry at me. And now I have sabotaged the entire program, right? In terms of the academic program. So now I've got to be cognizant that that is a potential and I got to be sensitive to it. So knowing that I've got just people in different places on the staff, I'm gonna be very sensitive in terms of how I broach these topics, right? I'm not, see, I'm not coming in like this, right? And I'm gonna say to you as an aspiring principal, you can't come in like, you can't come in bam. Like, like, like this stuff's been in me all this time. I finally got my shot. Now I got my first staff meeting and now you in front of your staff, bam! You can't do that, right? See, that's not gonna work. You're gonna, you're gonna lose them immediately, except for the ones who think like you, they're gonna be cheering for you, but that might not be your majority. So, so instead, you have to make sure that you that, that you got those people skills you are intentional about getting to know your staff where they are i remember i had a teacher teacher couldn't stand me and he and he and he, and he wanted to define me and, and 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 it just went opposed to everything i was about so i was about my male teachers i can't i can't dictate how you dress as a, as, a, as an employee 
but but I can say this is my vision. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build these men. So I want my boys in shirt and tie. So look, let's us wear shirt and tie, right? I mean, I'm gonna wear it as a principal, but my teachers, let's wear shirt and tie, slack shoes and a belt, right? So now he, he coming to school in jeans, uh, Eli Manning, New York Giants jersey uh, and, and sandals when it was still still warm outside. I'm like, so so I can't make, you know, he's, he's, he's contractually, he can do that. But I said, that's all right. Let me use my people skills, right? And, and, and so now I built a rapport with him. Right, I built a friendship. So now, oh, and by the way, he was a math teacher, but he never taught, right? He was the most popular teacher in the school before I got there because he read the sports page while the kids play games, play cards and so forth. And then I get there, right? So now he's popular, security, someone, you, you gotta watch this guy, he's popular, the kids love him, right? Because they, they don't have to work in this class. Okay, fine. Now he starts wearing the shirt and tie, slack, shoes, belt, he's teaching. Two years later, he is the teacher of the year, right? only because of the people skills. I could have come at this guy, bam, like, yo, what are you doing, man? This ain't what we about. Yo, you got to fix it. No, that, that stuff don't work, somebody. And so if there's some rookie out there and you think you're gonna strong arm somebody and you're gonna step to somebody, yo, this is not how we do things here. We do it this way, it's my way or the highway. That stuff don't work. That stuff work on movies, right? <laughs> like, like, go watch Lean On Me if you wanna see something like that, right? But, 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 but God rest Joe Clark's soul. But I'm saying to you, in the real world, man, no, nah, that stuff don't work. You could still exert your authority, but, but not be oppressive in the process. You can still exert your authority, but get love from everybody in that school. And, 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 and now you find everybody wants to be there. I had zero turnover. People say, how come nobody leaves you? I said, because they love coming here, man, because I'm not stepping on people. I ain't write a person up in years. If, if something happened that, 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 that I didn't particularly like, then we talk about it. I'm gonna treat you as a professional. It's a, you know, let's not, let's not let this happen anymore. It's done. I ain't put no memo in your mailboxes. Now you're gonna be mad. And then that's gonna, that's gonna have adverse implications on your ability to be the best you in the classroom. And, and, and one more thing, Jonathan, while, while you're in that program, you, you, you know, come back on that camera real quick. I got to show you, you got to get this. Oh, oh man, he already ahead of me, man. <laughs> well, hey, Kim, this, he already got the books, man. <laughs> Yo. I've been you you, know, you on the team. Got, got. <laughs> Appreciate hey. you. We got, we got to hook up at some point. Hey, Mr. Um, Adam, Greer, can I say a, something? Can I make a comment? Yes. yes, you may, Dr. Greer. <laughs> um, thank you. I really appreciate uh, uh, what I've heard today. I'm probably the oldest person on this uh, call, uh, on, on this room, uh, Zoom, because I'm 72 years old. <laughs> and so <laughs> this is uh, this has been a very good morning for me just to hear what you've had to say and to make me do some thinking because I'm not in a classroom haven't been there in a while, but I am on another end of the spectrum that I still dabble with, and that's teacher preparation mm. and teacher recruitment. And so many things that you have uh, covered today uh, made me or helped me to just start thinking and rethinking and smiling about and uh, just kind of turn some keys there because we've got to do a, a, how we recruit and train teachers. Yeah. It's got to change. Yeah. And so that when we get to the point where we enter that classroom, we are, we are knowledgeable and at least have some idea of the kinds of things that you have shared today. Yeah. And our, our teacher preparation programs, not only uh, the ones that I deal with here in Louisville, but across the state and across the country, we've got to start looking at things differently. That's and right. so I, I hope that the things that you've shared, the, that some of us older teacher educators and some of us old retired educators can start passing the word out and, and sitting as we sit on these boards and as we sit uh, thinking about where we're going with education and trying to recruit and, and interest younger people into coming into teaching, that we give some consideration 
to the kinds of things that you've talked about because this is this is important for the world. This is important for our kids. This is important for our country. And and if we're going to have an impact on education, it's nice that once you get there, then you start. But it may be even better to the profession to think about the profession that have some of the ideas that you have uh, expounded. So thank you. I appreciate thank that. Thank you, back. Thank, thank, you, you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Greer. And again, it's not just about recruiting, but it's also about retaining. What, what support system do we have in place to help and assist those teachers? What, 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 what are we putting in their toolkits so when they walk into those classes that they feel adequately prepared to do their job effectively? So, because they are not. Absolutely. Before we, um, Adam Nance, do you have a comment? Real, real quick, real quick, uh, hang on one second, Janice. Um, you know, um, I just wanna to respond to that briefly. When I was a principal at the high school level, I started a club and, it, and this was mine. I didn't delegate this to its, to its uh, staff member. I started a club, Future Teachers of America. And we, I had written at the time, I had a book called A Handbook for Teachers of African-American Children. And we use that as a text and we would meet every week and we would discuss education and we would discuss the, the, the prospects for them becoming teachers. The biggest regret, and I've said this for a long time now, the biggest regret that I have in leaving my school as their principal was that a lot of those young people, I used to take them to conferences, um, uh, future educator conferences, we, you know, we'd had the conversation, et cetera. The biggest regret I have in leaving that school is that a lot of those young people are now classroom teachers and I probably could have hired most of them, right? And, and see, I, I can only imagine what it would be like to lead a school and, and a percentage of the teachers in the school were your former students, right? Who, who, who learned the art of teaching, who, 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 who at least initially, your initial um, learning of teaching came from their principal, right? So, so their core would be their principal. And that's the biggest regret I have in leaving because so many of them out there teach every book I write, I send them free copies and say, look, read these and so forth. And um, so I'm, the reason I would even bring that up here is to say, and I don't know what you guys do in your, your respective districts, but I'm saying a lot of those future teachers that, that, that a lot of us are looking for, they're sitting in your classrooms, right? But, 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 but we're not necessarily tapping into them in a formal sense. Right, we may know of this this individual here, this individual here. Oh, you want to be a teacher, but that club where we're tapping into everyone. Because see, the first day I did this, I went on my PA system one day, and I said, if there's anybody that's even had just a fleeting thought of being a teacher one day, I need to see you at at, um, at three o'clock in the in the uh, in the library. And I had over a hundred kids show up. I'm like, wow, I, I thought it'd be like five of y'all. I had a, over a hundred kids show, and it stayed that large when we were having those meetings, they were really interesting, right? So it could be more that are teaching than I even know, because I'm not in touch with all of them kids anymore. But, I, but, but a lot of them that I am, that's what they do for a living. And some of them want to be principals. So sometimes, you know, we got to consider not just at the high school level, but the elementary level, the middle school level, we could start tapping into them kids now. They, they looking at you and saying, I want to be like you. I want to do what you do. I want to be like you. I admire you. I want to be you. That's the time to start tapping into them now and start exposing them to the information and so forth. And they start looking at what you do through a different lens as they get interest, become more so interested in one day becoming a classroom teacher. I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm morning. Janice Youngblood and I received the email from Dawson Almond Early Childhood Program. And I am so honored to be here this morning, Dr. Kefaili, because I am 72 years old and wow. instructional assistant at Dawson Almond Early Childhood Program. And it was in 1984 when I went back to school after my five, my fifth child turned four years old to get a two-year degree in early childhood. It took me 10 years to get that two-year degree because of those kids that I was raising. But I'm here today because I was interested in what the email was saying that you were going to be talking about and because I am in the classroom with these young children and have been with children since 84 working in a capacity from ages three to 21 years old and treatment programs of various kinds the things that you have said today have really 
uh, given me so much more inspiration to work in the community uh, as a volunteer at the community centers, things that you said, I know how uh, it can be so helpful, but even in the classroom with these, these young people now three and four years old, I, I have gained a lot more that you offered today. And I'm so honored. Thank you, Dr. Starks for the email that came through the Dawson Armand Early Childhood Program. I'm one of uh, a curious mind. I say, I gotta see what he's talking about because it sounds like something that we can gain and I, I just want to say thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your words. Absolutely. Uh, Adam Nance, you want to say something? Appreciate your time today. Um, I, earlier, I was supposed to comment if uh, we need to pass the collection plate, we can go ahead and, and do that <laughs> in a couple more hours. Yes. So, um, <laughs> Fortunately, I've uh, I follow you on Twitter and attended a couple of your sessions on on Facebook and, and really uh, okay. uh, much like you um, got into education uh, truly uh, not because of the curriculum or anything but to shape young men's lives and um, worked for my my first uh, principal I worked for understood that I, I needed not only that demographic in my classroom but also just a, a, a culturally diverse uh, classroom. And um, fast forward many years, I find myself a first year principal at a detention center here in Fayette County in, in, in Kentucky um, and uh, service some of the youth uh, from about 12 different counties and, and some from Jefferson. Um, we are drastically transforming our uh, library and, and then also, you know, having curriculum conversations where would you say would be the spot that would be the best place to go to uh, to find a, just a resource list that um, and you, I don't even have to tell you what uh, you know what the typical demographic is here um, you you already know where would be the best place to go yeah I've actually compiled that that resource list in terms of books for educators of uh, of black children partic particularly it's uh, if you go to my website principalcafele.com, click the tab that says uh, writings, and you'll see a, a, a orange bar show up that says blogs. Click that and then scroll way back because I, I, I have a lot of blog articles. So just scroll way down and you'll see where it says suggested reading from principal uh, by Principal Cafele. And it's about 150 books, but I break them up into categories, right? So to make it easier on the reader. And um, you'll see it there. And, and if not that way, then you can just go right to my web page, my, um, my um, blog page at principalcafelewrites, plural, dot com. And then just scroll way back and you'll, you'll see it there. Um, Kim Landrum from OVEC. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, it just was an amazing conversation and um, I have learned so much. And although I know there's still a lot of work to be done out there, um, I feel privileged that I get to be part of the group that hopefully is doing the right work to make uh, changes in people's lives. And uh, we, have, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm committed to continuing it. And I'm so thankful that we have people like you that are willing to share um, not only their story, but obviously their expertise to make um, this world just a better place to be in. So uh, just thank you for, for re-motivating me. Um, not that I was unmotivated, but just um, just really lighting the fire again. So Appreciate thank you very much. A Friday, Friday morning spark. Appreciate Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from um, Jeff Rhodes. Jeff Rhodes has a question. I do. Thank you very much for uh, for doing this. This is awesome. I've, I've heard you speak before, you. Dr. Cafele, and uh, they should have had you as the premier speaker at CASA one year when you came up to uh, the Gold House, if you remember that. Yeah. Forty yeah. five years ago, they should have had you as the premier speaker, man. You know, I was, I was, you know, I was still on the come up back then. You know, what I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have invested early. Is what so you're saying? Fine, My fault. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should have invested early. You were, uh, you were a good IPO to get involved with. Appreciate it. You know, I know one thing you mentioned is you, you know, I'm a middle school principal and you had spent some time in a middle school. So I, you, my first question was just walk me through like your, your jump, like I've not been here for four years now, but you know, you've, 
you stepped into that school day one and you had this vision. And so, I, so let's, let's go a little deeper if you don't mind. Okay. We're going to go, we're going to go into the bowels of the school for a second. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to go into not that first time where you're standing up and, and, and you, you're winning them over with, you know, your ideas and your passion and your voice and all that. Take me to, if you wouldn't mind, that first meeting where, like at the end of the day, we got to get kids better, right? Like if we really want these kids to walk out of here, no matter what race, background, color, gender, like they've got to get, they've got to have success here, right? Um, you walk into that first meeting and, you know, you're looking at some data and I, maybe it was day one for you, maybe like the very first school data you got back or, or the first classroom data you got back was amazing, but we all know it's a process and that typically isn't what happens. So yeah. tell me about that first meeting, if you would, take me back. Data's still not where you want it to be, but it's, it's there. And, you know, all of a sudden now it's that personal, that personal thing for teachers, right? It's, I heard the message and I believed it, but look, I'm still getting the same results I always got. So take me to that or just that experience. I'm, I'm very curious of what that was like. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I led four schools over the uh, over my my 14 year leadership career, and one comes to mind when you say that. I led a school, and, and, and as a matter of fact, just as a follow up, get the uh, go online to ASCD, the current issue of Education Leadership, the December January issue is on mental health. Uh, I wrote one of the articles um, that talks about that school. It's, it's, I forget the name, I forget the exact title of the article, but it's, it's something about school leadership and maintaining mental balance or something. But that school, two things happened. Uh, number one, when I, when I took over, when I came back to that particular district, the school was one of the lowest performing schools in the entire state. The test scores were in the, in the teens. But then when I got there that July 1st, on July 5th, I got a letter from the state indicating that the school was also considered the most dangerous school in North Jersey. Um, and, and one of seven schools identified in the entire state of New Jersey. So now I've got to go, I'm the new, I'm, I'm the, new the, the, the new leader in the building. I'm not a new leader, but I'm new to that building. And I'm coming from another district. And now I've got to prove to that staff that we can overcome this. Right, so that first staff meeting, in fact, I'm meeting with teachers informally that summer, but because of that persistently dangerous designation, the school was, was in the national news, not just the local news, but the national news as this dangerous school. So we're on television uh, for, for, for several days with that. And now I've got to convince this staff that you're in good hands, but then coupled with that, just, just in terms of how, how you framed it, under No Child Left Behind, the parents can move all their kids out of there right and put them in a safer school that's what the, the law accommodated no child left behind so now i got to convince not only staff in terms of your question but parents because they wanted out they were lined up <laughs> I, so so i convinced them that they had the right leader and then with staff it was it, you know see first and foremost with staff as it relates to that question it wasn't so much what we're going to accomplish you know in, in terms of what that data revealed First and foremost was the sell of me. See, I, I had to sell them on the fact that we're going to be fine under this leadership, right, under this particular principle. So that was the sell. And then and then as I'm selling that, and, and, and that wasn't by, you know, just talking, that was them kind of seeing me, seeing me move. And then as I'm able to sell me that, 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 that we got solid leadership, now we could start talking about data because now they're going to be that much more receptive because of the trust in the leader. See if, see if, see if they don't trust me, just like them parents, right? I mean, we, we were standing room only. I said, look, before you guys try to move your kids, I got a meeting schedule, August 28, 2003. I still know the date. I said, hey, come hear me out, right? So, so now they came and heard me. I said, look, we good, we good. And I told them why we were good. They said, we believe in you. One parent wanted out. I said, bye. And then, and, and then three weeks later, parent wanted back in, right? Because, because everyone knew the school, the school had shifted, right? So now proving yourself that you are that guy that that school needs in terms of the leadership in order to make all those other variables work 
for you. That's that's the selling. That's the sale right there. You got to be. Able to, you, they got to. They got to trust you. They got to be convinced that we have good leadership because you you can talk to teach anywhere, and they and 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 you talk about the problems of the school. They go and point to the principal all the time. Oh, the leadership. <laughs> that's the problem. Leadership. You, you hear it all the time. But if that if that staff trust the leadership, now we can roll up our sleeves and get the work done and have the tough conversation, whether it be data, whether it be race, ethnic, culture, you know, all that kind of stuff we talked about today. But the teacher is receptive to the conversation because I trust in the leadership of the building. See that that Thank matters. You, Dr. Kafeli, and we have um, Dr. Meg Hancock. She is the Associate Dean for Academic Services and was um, um, very supportive in uh, making sure that you were here today. Day. And so Dr. Meg Hancock, would you like to say something to um, Dr. Kafeli? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Stark. Um, uh, Principal Kafeli, I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. I can't tell you how many people have already sent me texts and emails about how powerful this conversation was. Um, and I think, you know, as we move forward, both in our, um, our personal work, as well as our professional work, this this is a, I don't want to say a great starting point because there are many people who have been um, doing this work, but it is an absolute catalyst for us um, as we think about the way that we are going to prepare ourselves um, through education, the way that we are going to prepare our students who are future educators and the experience that we are going to create for our students in the classroom. And, um, you know, I know that we have a number of faculty at the university who have been on this call and we are in the process of significant revisions to our undergraduate and graduate programs. And this is undoubtedly going to be um, embedded within the development of those programs and that new curriculum. And I just wanted to, again, thank you thank for you. giving us outstanding questions for us to reflect on, again, personally and professionally. And I am really excited to continue to engage my colleagues in these conversations so that we can really think about how to change the experience for all of our students in the classrooms and change the experience for ourselves as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate um, we, have, we have Dr. Mom, Charlene Holloway. She's from the NAACP. Oh, okay. and she's um, like to say a few words. Uh, first of all, Dr. Hancock and Dr. Stark, thank you for bringing Principal Baruti back. I heard him speak at the games years ago. Oh. He's a personal friend of my cousin uh, named Guy Whitlock from Montclair, yeah. New Jersey. I have a granddaughter who teaches at Milburn T. Maupin, and I'm so happy she that she can see the tape now because she's teaching today. Her seven-year-old boy-girl twins started preschool at the Dawson Orman, and Janice Youngblood was one of their teachers. She made a great impact on them. And uh, we just appreciate you here in Louisville. I've already texted Guy Whitlock and <laughs> showed him your picture. He said, fantastic. Thank you for coming back. A, long time a great Thank presentation. You. Thank you much. I appreciate you. Appreciate hey, uh, again, um, thank you. And um, I guess um, uh, I'll call on two more people before we close this up, you know, wrap this up. Um, again, uh, um, Derek, um, you have any Parting comments and then Tyler Jones. Well, um, I just want to say that uh, it was really um, inspiring, re inspiring. I've always uh, hearing your story at the beginning and your thought process when you first started teaching. I was like, well, I thought those same things. And uh, it was really inspiring to hear that and initially hear your journey and, and the way your way of thinking about. Uh, equity and inclusion, it really uh, fortified my own uh, drive and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Now, now, what, what, are you in the classroom right now? Um, I am the, um, the restorative practice coach. I, use, I started off as a Spanish teacher. I teach at Iroquois High School, which is one of our most challenging high schools here in uh, Jefferson County. I chose to work there. I love working there. 
um, I just felt that uh, it was an opportunity for me to help those kids see outside their bubble. Um, I've, I've lived abroad and that kind of opened my eyes and see myself more than just being the black man <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and becoming more than that and saying, hey, we are, we're not monolithic and we are very varied and diversified as, as people. So um, I really wanted to bring that back to the students and say, hey, there's a lot more for you uh, in this world. There's a lot more that you can, you can accomplish. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Yes. Hey, thank you, Derek. And then we're going to close up with Tyler. Hey, hey Dr. Starr, real quick, is, is, is Kathy Gunn still there? She's not here. I'm still here. Uh, okay, hey, Kathy. Ms. Gunn, I'm, I'm, you know, I just read the comment. Yeah, those message to your son videos, uh, I got to get back on it. I, I've been hesitant since I grew all this gray, right? <laughs> so I'm like, well, they, are they going to listen to me? <laughs> I yes. might have to shave for <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I appreciate the comment because I I made we got like two hundred some out of those videos. For those that don't know, those are videos on YouTube that I made for the young men, and then there's about five there for the for the young men and the young ladies. But but the focus was the young men. These little short five minute clips where I'm just talking about two hundred different topics of being successful in the classroom. And you can go to YouTube and type in "message to your son" and you'll you'll see them all. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Kathy. Um, Tyler? Um, I'm an, I'll never forget when you came out like six years back, maybe. I think you actually spoke in a middle school to everybody. You were with Anthony Muhammad and somebody else. But um, you yeah. talked about the way that when you came into a school to lead it, you created the culture. You said it started with you because it's your school. And I'll never forget you say, you know, you see a kid walking across the street with their pants hanging down. But when they stepped on my sidewalk, right. they started pulling them up because they knew that was what it was expected. Yep. So I know I would be terrified to be a principal because I just, I don't, I, I can't follow the rules that well. But uh, um, um, for the principals that are out there that are trying to create their vision and their message and pass it on to the schools and, and have everybody in the school get on the same page, um, that's fabulous. I guess I would ask you, what do you think teachers should possibly do where that vision isn't collective or where that vision isn't being led from the top possibly. Do you see, or have you been other places where you've seen successfully teachers take up that mantle? Yeah, I, I have. You see, um, as a fifth grade teacher, I, you know, we, we were departmentalized. Um, we start uh, this particular district from third grade on up, they changed classes. So I saw so, so I, I had, I had, I was in both worlds. Prior to that, I had my class all day. So now I've got my homeroom, and they're going to different teachers, and I'm hearing them through the walls, and it was, it, it was disturbing me because I knew that that's not who they were. So I, I brought my, I, you know, I wasn't an administrator. I'm not even a team leader. We just, just five, to four teachers. So I said, look, let's, let's, let's start talking amongst ourselves, but let's also. If, if you guys can tolerate this, let's start having parent workshops in the evening, like 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 a couple times a month. Let's let's bring in the parents. Let's let's put a full court press on bringing them into the school, and let's let's make them aware of what their roles are because some of them don't really know definitively what their roles are with their children as educators. So let's let's do that. So as so as I'm engaging them through a different lens because this is me kind of being quasi administrator, and then also the parents now to despite whatever the culture is in the building i'm able to do something in isolation with them right that so 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 that you know forging a team a real team on the one hand but then in another place i was it's just i gotta close my door right and, and I, I just because the culture is not conducive right this is what i'm self-contained now so i gotta close my door and I got to do this thing in isolation from the rest of the school. And that's part of the incentive I had to become a principal because that was frustrating to have to close the door and isolate yourself from the rest of the school. But keep in mind, you know, during the times when we could fly in an airplane, keep in mind that you can get on the plane. Think about them little small express jets, right? We've got, we got one row of seats on one side and two seats you know, going back to the on the other side. And so a real small plane. And you could get on that plane and you feeling really good health-wise, you feeling good. 
but there's one sick passenger and you're gonna be on that little jet for about the next two, three hours. So now this passenger is coughing from the time you went on the plane, got on the plane until the time you land, you could best believe it's gonna be some sick passengers on that plane. And in most cases, I was one of them, right? Cause, because, because you know, my immune system was always low cause I'm always running. So I'm saying that to say that one person can infect, and I'm not even putting this in the context of COVID, one person can infect a whole lot of people. So in a school, when you got a, a, a school, a culture in a school that's toxic, it can, if it can infect a whole lot of other classrooms if you allow it to. So I said, I, I gotta close my door, man. I gotta isolate myself from what's going on around me because I don't have control or influence over it yet until I get into this next, this next level as a principal. So I was able to do that and thereby experience what we experienced as a class, but it was sad. I didn't, I didn't like it, but that was the reality so that I don't lose my class because of the broader school. Sorry. So as a principal, I'm so sorry. So as a principal, you also then included parents a, a yeah, lot. I'm speaking to you as a teacher just now. That totally. Whole, but I mean, but then when you got there, you ran parent involvement, yeah. parental involvement, and it got them into the schools. We continue and that's to a, do that. Yeah, so okay. we did that on the school level and had all sorts of incentives in place to make sure that we had strong participation. But I'm going to tell you something real quick. This, this pandemic, you know, is, 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 is as tragic as it is, there are some silver linings as it relates to school. And one of the silver linings is this platform called Zoom right, or, or any virtual space. Zoom is my favorite of, of all of them because I'm on all of them, but here's why. It's, it can be a challenge depending on the neighborhood to get parents to come out because, because if it, depending on the neighborhood, some parents may not wanna go through the neighborhood in order to get to the school at night, they feel safer at home, right? But, but, but this thing here, I, I've been preaching since March, to, to, since April to educators that if, if I was a principal beyond post um, COVID, and, and, and we have this platform, I'll be talking to parents weekly, right? I mean, I, I mean the way I, I'll, be, I'll talk to parents, and I even had my day. Every Monday night is going to be parent night. I'll have the entire school on this screen. If I'm not in a rural district, which I never was before, so I don't think I would be now, I'm urban. So that way, I'm going to ensure that everybody has, in, has, has connectivity and a laptop, right? I, I'll own that. Everybody's going to have connectivity and a laptop. So now I just, my challenge will not be getting them connectivity. My challenge will be getting them on the screen. I'm going to do that. So now student performance will be even better than it was because I'm literally talking to the parents of the school every Monday night for an hour right, or, or less, or less, depending on what the needs are. But we had those conversations, if they wanna talk and so forth, then you know, it'd be more time. But this is the silver line. And so I'm saying that the, the reason I would bring that up is to say to the leaders on here right now, man, I don't know if you realize it or not, maybe you way ahead of me, but, but this platform here, you, you don't have to have parent meetings like every, once a month, once a quarter, whatever it is. Man, you could talk to them parents every week, right? Because they're gonna come on if you invite them. How, they're not gonna run away from that. You might have your, your aberrations, but you're gonna have the masses. And now you can say to them, and look, have your child sitting by this computer too, right? And now you have that conversation, that discussion about whatever it is you wanna discuss, man, that's gonna, that's gonna, have, that, that's gonna reverberate throughout the building, right? So, so if you haven't considered that, do it. I'm, I'm talking to parents. If I'm, if I'm having staff meetings two, three, four times a month, I'm having parents four times a month as well. Hey, thank you very much. Anyone else want to comment before we wrap this up? Um, um, Jessica, uh, Yasmin, and or anyone else before we, um, I know we've gone over time, but um, um, thank you for those who want to hang back and do the Q&A with Dr. Uh, with Principal Kefaili. Um, Anyone else? I had a mentor a long time ago that, that, that I used to say to her, man, everybody keeps calling me doctor. And I, I'm tired of telling people to just stop calling me doctor. And she That's said to me, family. she said, let it ride. Just let them call you doctor. They calling you doctor because you coming across like one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, who, who, who was next? It, it's me. Um, so I guess what I'm processing right now, and this is just me being very vulnerable, <clears throat> and very transparent is so I'm in my second year as a principal 
uh, at an elementary school and I have a previous background in business. So before I became an educator, but um, I guess what I'm grappling with right now as a leader, as a black woman, as a mother um, is being a leader, a model, a um, advocate and a teacher while also still being a learner and also being just human. So all of the things that are, have transpired this year, I mean, I think a lot of us are very, very vulnerable. I think we are very, um, for lack of a better word, at times even fragile. And so, but, but that doesn't negate the, the responsibility of our role and our leadership. It's just like, I mean, I may have to grieve as a mother, but that doesn't negate my responsibility to help my daughter grieve. Mm -hmm. And so being an educator right now, it's really, really tough um, to do all the things and to lead the charge, but still be mindful of like, well, where am I? How, how, how am I feeling? How am I coping? Um, and am I even in a, in a place right now to even lead that if I don't deal with me yeah. um, and address me. So that's that's just my like vulnerable, transparent moment. Um, I often, you know, battle back and forth between, okay, well, is now the right time to say something or is now the right time to address it? Or, well, you know, all, all those things, overthinking. But um, that's just kind of where I am personally as, as an educator. Yeah, well, you, you know something, what you're saying is, is very normal. And, 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 and you just have to be intentional about how you address it. And see, I, I had to learn the hard way. Um, you, you have to maintain a balance, right? There, there's got to be a balance between what you do as a leader and who you are away from the school, right? Or, or, or virtually away from the computer when, when, when school's in session. There, there's there's got to be a balance there. But in terms of, because because what I'm he, what I'm hearing you say, you, you you're talking about the dynamics of 2020, 2021, and the challenges that come along with that, right? And 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 and, and, it, and it made it a little bit more complicated, in terms of staff, student, uh, I'm I'm sorry, administrator, staff relations, if we're going to broach it, right? Um, so so here's what I will want yourself and and the rest of us on, who are still on the call to think about, um. You have to delve into these, 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 these tough conversations, right? And it's got to be so that when, when the next tragedy occurs in the world, that you have established a culture where we're accustomed to this now. We can listen to it now. But in terms of, because see, I'm, I'm, I'm very empathetic to Black woman women in leadership in schools I, I understand that dynamic that's 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 a different dynamic than say a black man in leadership a white man a white woman in leadership black woman in leadership brings a whole lot of other connotations to it that that, that you got to grapple with on your staff so see therefore you got to approach it that way right because because you know that that reality exists so therefore you're not going to run away from it you're gonna meet it head on right so but 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 see with those perceptions and the angry black woman and the this and the that right see that's where those conversations that you that that you launch start to occur because see remember quite a few hours ago I said one could analyze today but have a gaping hole in their analysis because they don't know the past see so so th so that past is so critical that history is so critical for people understanding the present, right? So, so now engaging your staff in some of those kinds of conversations to understand what that is, but also you being privy, you being aware of perception and thereby positioning yourself in a way that that's not an issue amongst your staff. But see, but, but see, it's, you, you gotta finesse it, right? And you, you, gotta, you gotta maneuver it. Because it's because see when when a when when a guy like myself comes in, who's got all this 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 historical stuff in him and this political stuff, and I'm not going I'm not going to run away from that. So I have to finesse it. See see like let me, let me grab this book here off my shelf. It's in there too tight. I'm struggling. Now nah, I ain't gonna pull it. I might pull a whole shelf down. My, my, I was gonna bring I was gonna pull a history book out, but here's the thing. 
I knew I wanted this book in my building. It's, 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 it's called Journey to Liber Liberation. It's an it's a African-American textbook, African-American history textbook. Journey to Liberation by Dr. Malefi Asante, A-S-A-N-T-E. He created the first PhD program in black studies on the planet earth and at Temple University. So instead of me not doing what I wanna do, I, I, I got permission from the soup and brought it on in but then I had to position myself to be able to make staff understand. It's not like I got this black staff that, that this, this built-in understanding, right? It's that, that's not what it was. So I got to position myself that staff understands my mission. Cause see, like if this was a whole, if, if this was just a leadership audience, I, I always talk about, I distinguish the school mission from the leadership mission, the school vision from the leadership vision, the school purpose from the leadership purpose. They're not necessarily the same. They may complement one another, but, but, but best believe my leadership mission is much more intense than the school mission, right? So, so therefore, I want to walk in my mission. I want to walk in my vision and I want to walk in my purpose. And therefore, I got to finesse it so that my staff understand me. So that's just a protracted conversation over a long period of time. And there are bumps in the road because everybody's not gonna just snap and now, oh yeah, I, I'm with you, I, I hear you, I'm down with you, I feel you. No, it's, it's not gonna happen. They'll be in the parking lot talking about you and you might, might be calling you a racist, all that kind of stuff, but, but, but you don't let that deter you, right? But then on the personal side, you know, you're dealing with family and, and, and children, all that kind of stuff, it's that balance. Get that, get, go to ASCD.org and, and read that issue I talked to you about. Check out my article, but, but there's a lot in there, right? It's right on there, it's, it's the current issue, educational leadership, that balance. See, see, I had a heart attack um, five years ago. It wasn't while I was a principal, it was while I was a speaker. I had it on the stage. I had it doing a keynote in, at the University of Miami. No balance, right? No balance. So I'm, 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 I'm living off of crap when I'm on the road, meaning the food I was eating. Right, so, so a lot of grease, a lot of salt, and a whole lot of soda, right? When we say soda, we talking like maybe six to 10 a day, right? So no balance, so I pay the price for it, right? So I'm saying here, whether it be mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, gotta have that balance. Because at the end of the day, these schools, y'all, these are not your whole life. As, as much as you may want to walk in, walk on the shoulders of Dr. King, I'll use him as an example today since it's his birthday. And you might want to, you know, be, you know, be that microcosm of King in your school and you Superman, Superwoman, all that kind of stuff. You got to balance that out where you're not Superman and Superwoman. You just got to be you, right? Because if you're trying to go home and you still Superman, Superwoman, from the energy from the school and you bringing that home and you still trying to be that as opposed to just kind of leaving that hat at the building and, and, and putting on your, your mom hat, right? And then whatever hats you wear in your house to strike the bounce, the school will be there. It'll be there, it'll be there waiting for you, right? Sometimes we got to purge it from our thinking if we can, purge it from our spirit if we can and focus on those things that, that, that make us whole when we're away from the building, right? So just consider that y'all, cause you know, it's, it's these schools can burn, I, you know, ASCD also made available uh, publicly a last, uh, another issue that I'm in, it's an issue on burnout. So I wrote an article called Avoiding School Leadership Burnout. So go to EL, Education Leadership on ASCD.org. I forget what month it's in, it's like 2019 or 18, well, I, don't, I don't know, but they made it available for free. So you can just click it and read it because burnout is real. Absolutely. and. Um... Um, Jessica Jones, she's an assistant principal. She had a, a question, and we're going to end with Jessica. Yes, ma'am. We're going to end for real. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Principal Kafele. Everything that you said the past few hours, was, first of all, it didn't seem like it was that long, but um, always engaged. I've, I've attended several of your Saturday sessions. Okay. I have all your books. Um, um, I am just, you know, my my... I want to say first to thank uh, Yasmin because I was really going to say something very similar to what she said, um, but I'm going to go a little bit further. Um, so this 
being at home, um, being at NTI, then seeing some of the rise of social injustice happening all around um, has caused us to also have those difficult conversations, crit critical conversations with our staff. Um, we're pretty heavily um, um, diverse teaching staff, however, heavy African-American black leadership staff. Mm. And so um, it's, it's, it's kind of awakened a few of the, the um, attitudes, uh, a few of the, the ways in which we hold some of our conversations now that we've had something occur, the Breonna Taylor, you know, right here in Louisville, that's, that's home. Um, and we're having these conversations and then we find out that some of our staff members, you know, are facing this, you know, or following this kind of um, racist ideology. Um, and it, I'm, I'm afraid of how to handle that when, it, when I'm sure it will snowball into the classroom. Um, it, since we're in NTI, some of that conversation does not occur um, as it would if we were in person. Um, just this last, you know, the insurrection, for example, many of our uh, white colleagues did not know how to uh, approach the conversation in their classroom, so they chose not to. Um, and so um, there was a lot, there's quite a few others that we have these very um, visible instances occurring daily, it seems, on the news. And I just don't know. I, I'm a, the closer we get back to go, being in the building and then seeing some of the comments that some of our staff members are making and their viewpoints, it's causing me concern for when our students come back. I really don't know how we're going to be united before that time occurs. And um, our students are, they're, you know, they're many adults. Some of them are the head of their households because of the ways that they, you know, they live their uh, community. And so they will tell you exactly how they feel. And I'm just, you know, I'm concerned about what, what can I do um, as Jasmine, as you, um, admitted to her, you know, as being a black woman, um, out of the, the five in our leadership team, four of us are black women. And so, um, you know, you had that, I don't want to listen to you because you are a woman, as well as I don't necessarily need to listen to you because you're a black woman. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that's probably all over the place and a little loaded, but how would you uh, suggest to deal with situations like that? Yeah, it's um, it's, it's it's it really begs a, a broader conversation. But let me let me say this. Let me go back to the first part you were talking about first with the insurrection. Um, I don't know if you were on the call last Saturday when I when I when I put that in a historical context in mm -hmm. terms of that energy that stormed that capital. But I put it in a historical context, and I would I would I would encourage all of you on the call to go back and watch it. It's on YouTube on my virtual AP Leadership Academy uh, channel. It's the first video, because it was last week, uh, week number 37. Just take a look. They're long, they're all an hour long. And then tomorrow, I'm, I'm gonna talk about, see, see, last week, I just talked about historical implications. Tomorrow, I'm gonna talk about the classroom. In, in other words, I'm gonna answer your question over the entire hour tomorrow morning at 11 Eastern. Um, I'll be there. Yeah, yeah, come on in, because I got a lot to say. And but but the short answer here is that, you know, just just having the audacity to have the conversation. But but what I've learned and in, in, in which is why I love history so much is uh, if, if I could quote Malcolm, Malcolm X, Malcolm said, history is best qualified to reward all research. Right. So see. In in, in, in approaching that conversation about the insurrection. When I use history as a backdrop, it makes it that much more understandable, right? Because see, just the, the very short, cause I'm not gonna, you know, obviously I'm not gonna repeat myself with that here. We, we, we're at the end of a presentation, but here, you know, in turn, we, we saw what, what we saw, and I hope you all that are on the call can handle me saying this this way. 
we saw white mob violence. That's what we saw. But as I explained last week, and I'm sure I'll get into it again tomorrow, but I want to focus more on the classroom. For an African American who knows history, that which we saw last Wednesday was nothing new. That was a continuation of something that we've seen in history over the centuries, geared toward us, right? Now, of course, that wasn't geared toward us. We weren't, you know, we weren't like the, the victims inside of the Capitol. But the, but, the, but the issue was when you look at, eh, I'm not even gonna get into it, but, 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 but when you look at, you look at a Confederate flag, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll use it there because I don't wanna get deep into this right here. You look at that flag, right? Don't, don't, that, that flag hurts me, right? When I looked at that noose, although you know it said that was symbolically there for Mike Pence, but just the sight of a noose, man, that, 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 that's painful to look at. That, that's, a, that's a painful image to see, right? That flag is a painful symbol to look at for me. Right, I'm in, I'm in, I'm, you know, like, like stereotypically. So you go down south, you see symbol, you see uh, Confederate flags. But I can go to Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois and see Confederate flags. Right, I don't have to go down in the south to see a Confederate flag. I can stay up here. I can stay in Jersey and see Confederate flag. So those those images hurt. They're painful just to look at, particularly when you understand history. Right. So I'm saying here that a lot of times we engage in this conversation these conversations, but the history, the historical aspect is not a part of the conversation. We're just talking contemporary. So when we're talking contemporary, it's like people have blinders on, they can't really see. They can't see what you're saying. They can't hear what you're saying because, be, because, because they don't have that context. So that's why I always go back to history when I'm trying to explain something. Right, like, 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 like when we talk about the, let me give you this one example. We talk about the greatness of Black Wall Street, right? So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's like unlike anything that we've seen in history in terms of what they were able to accomplish in Greenwood section of Port Tulsa with all those businesses, right? But, but, but even though that's a big story, for me in this context, the bigger story is that it doesn't exist anymore. Right, it, I mean, we're talking 35 blocks burned to the ground, right? We're talking hundreds of people killed. We're talking, we're, we're talking 1,256 homes destroyed, right? We're talking little kerosene bombs dropped from airplanes. We're talking those, there are no graves for those people. They, they, were, they, they built a city on top of those lives, just like they did in New York. Right in, in in terms of the enslaved population, they built Lower Manhattan on top of bl on, on black bodies. Right, so so when so when put in that context, a lot of times the people that we're trying to convince, they don't know that they don't know these stories. They're not aware. So so they're, they're operating on what they know in contemporary times, but they don't know the history. So when we start talking about the history or having the book study or having the article study, which which would probably be better, the article study on some of these aspects of history, it's like, oh, oh, I, I wasn't aware, right? And now it, it kind of opens up that, that door to have that conversation. Because at the end of the day, because I'm talking to my, I'm talking to educated colleagues right now. At the end of the day, we, like, 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 like let's say just those of us who are still here, we're colleagues in the same building. We still, we have to be friends after this conversation. Right, we ain't gotta be buddy, buddy, go, we gonna hang out at the mall, but we gotta be friends in terms of our professional relationship, right? I'm, let's, let, let's make me principal for a second. I need you guys to come, we gonna have the tough conversation on Wednesday night, Wednesday afternoon at, at school. I need y'all still coming in fired up on Thursday, right? I still need y'all feeling the principal on Thursday because that matters if you, if, 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 if you trust, if you still trust the leader. So I still need that dynamic in place. But if we had a conversation and now we're all over the place, we're angry, we teed off, we're looking for a, another place to work and I don't like this guy no more and I don't like my colleagues no more, then we, have, we, we, we are destroying children because that's who's, that, that's who's gonna suffer. We'll be okay, but the children gonna suffer because, we, because we're not bringing the same energy into that classroom. So all that has to be considered. And that's why, you know, I always go back, I said, Malcolm, history, best qualified to reward 
all research. That's a famous quote of his, right? And, 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 and to me, it just makes sense. It's like up here in the New York area, used to be this, this, this sports commentator named Wolf, um, Warner Wolf. And his, 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 his famous expression is, let's go to the videotape. That's what he always used to say, let's go to the videotape. Well, history is going to the videotape. We, let's, let's go, let's see what the historical record says. And then it makes the contemporary make that much more sense, right? If, if you could give me one second, let me just make this last point. A lot, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the Breonna Taylors, the George Floyds, they come up in these discussions, right? In, 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 this, in this world that we're in right now. And I say to folks all the time, I say, look, I want you to understand something. I don't think that there's a black person in America alive that was surprised by George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. I, I, if, if, if there was someone, if there's a black person on this planet shocked by that, I'd like to meet them. I'd like to tell me what shocked you about this? Have, have your eyes not been open? Have your ears not been, what, what about, what is, what is it about this that shocked you? But the difference was this, with George Floyd, we saw it. We saw a man go from life to death on a video. We saw it. We've never seen that before. Right. That so 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 how it happened was surprising. But here's the thing. White America. White America saw it. And white America saw what black folks had been screaming for the past 402 years. See, that was the difference. So when you saw them, when you saw the streets, you saw you saw a lot of that footage was predominantly white out there. Peaceful protests. Right, predominantly white, because white Americans said, oh, wait a minute. They saw what that police officer did for eight minutes and 46 seconds. They, they saw it and said, no, this ain't right. We said, this is what we've been telling you. See, that was the difference. We, we, that was, we weren't, I didn't look at that, like my TV's over here. I wasn't shocked. I, ju I just was mad, but I wasn't shocked. And see, that's the difference. So, so a, 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 lot, a lot of white America was shocked, like, oh, that, that, that was not good. Yeah, but, but neither were all these other ones, right? So, so now people got on board and you had, you had mass movement, right? Not only in America, but worldwide, right? So, but the reason I brought that up is to say, is to say this, the reason that black America wasn't shocked because history is best qualified to reward all research. See, there's enough history to go back into time, right? If you didn't see that movie Rosewood, go see it, right? My wife and I vowed to never see that movie again. I don't, I don't ever want to see that movie again. My wife, it, 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 was, it was so weird. We sitting in the theater, she's sitting there listening to me right now. We was in the theater and, and, and we both said, this is 1923 when, the movie, when it was based on, we sat there and cried for an entire film. It's one thing, you know, like, like a certain thing happened in a film and you might have some tears. We cried for the whole bloody movie. Right, the whole movie, we just sat there and just couldn't stop. It, 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 so, so see, that's 1923. So now we're talking about 100 years ago, but yet we can go back further. Black Wall Street was 1921. We can go back even further into the 1800s, 1700, 1600, right? So then when you have that kind of historical context, historical reference, then Breonna Taylor, we understand this. We're not shocked. We're angry, but we ain't shocked. See, that's the difference, right? I hope you guys can handle that. That's gonna be good because because see, that's that's necessary, right? Especially on a call like this, we need to be able to have this kind of conversation, right? And it because because then you go back to your school, you may not you know approach it the way I just did, you know. But but you want but you want to ultimately be able to get to a, a place with it with your staff that we can have this conversation, and yet we can still hug one another when we finish having the conversation. That's it, that's the goal. I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you, Bailey, you know, and um, try to give them <laughs>